My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. It's the only respect. That's respect. You honor a man when you communicate your substance. You say, honor the Lord with your substance. Your substance is a product of your life. So when you commit the sin to a man, you are placing him above yourself. But when a man gets married, there's another dimension that is added to it. You honor a man the way you treat his wife. If you truly honor a man, you will reverence his wife, whether he's there or not. Because his wife becomes a part of him. I want to see those that honor Reverend Tolu Agola this morning by giving it up to our mama in the house. Come on. First time I met Reverend in Makodi. Say, is this the Reverend to do? <laughs> and he just kept his calm. But if you have any element of discernment, you know he's not just a father, he has the grace of a patriarch. And so when we have his kind, it's important. Not just to submit to his vision, but to play as much role as is required to partner with it. Because it's a parable to a generation. It's a signature of God for a dispensation. Many will be anointed, but the grace for fatherhood is not an anointing. It's a function of the politics of heaven. God chooses them by divine ordination. And many will be fathers, but not many will be patriarchs. The patriarchal dimension is a bequeather of God to honorable men on the strength of what they catch in God and the diligence to immortalize it. That's why Adam is not captured in Hebrews chapter 11. You are not a patriarch because you came first. You are a patriarch because you caught a dimension in God and you immortalize it through your life. We thank God to be part of this work this morning and we trust the Lord that everything he will do this morning will last forever in the name of Jesus. Just lift your hands toward heaven and whisper something to Jesus. I'm here with my brother and my tag team partner, Pastor Victor Ogbe. Victor stabilizes the work and it generates the fuel. Such a great honor to travel with him from place to place. Whisper to the Lord this morning your love for him. Tell him how much you love him. I know you've troubled the heavens for anointings. You've troubled the heavens for graces. But tell God this morning how much you love him. He is interested to know your heart for him. Tell him your heart beats for him. Tell him it's your focus. It's him you want, not ministry. If ministry results from your intimacy with him, then glory to his name. But it's him you want. 
Come on, whisper to the Lord this morning. Is that the much you love him? If there is more, tell him. Tell him, tell him. I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. Worship from afar. I just want to be with you. I just want to be where you are. Come on, talk to the Lord this morning. Take me to the place where you are. He told the church in Ephesus, a church of many mighty works, so deep in the spirit that they proved the apostles. They were strong in the sandman, they were mighty, but they said they've lost their first love. He said, If anyone love not the Lord, let him be anathema maranatha. You can be walking, doing mighty things on earth, but in the spirit you are in the shed, waiting for the Lord to come before your faith is decided. Tell him you love him this morning. Don't forget everybody around you. If that is achieved, the goal is achieved. It's possible to love the ministry and not love the Lord. It's possible to love the people and not love the Lord. It's possible to love the anointing and not love the Lord. It's possible to love the upward of men and not love the Lord. Ale da brasa batelina ma pedagogi Isti mancho te go Sarà da fare fuori Il mio padre Da spero Sono tu I just want to be Thank you, Father. We give you praise this morning for another privilege to interact with your essence, to look upon you as you are. We know we'll be transformed, we'll be changed. There will be a migration from where we are to where we ought to be. Bless us with your presence this morning. Let's see you as you are. Beyond the utterance, beyond the revelation, may your essence be communicated. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you so much for turning out in your numbers this morning. I want to share with us a few things that we must pay attention to if we must be relevant. It's not enough to come. There are definite things that must be done to you for you to be relevant. It is often said, you can come as you are. But the truth is, over time, when God begins to use you, you know you cannot be used as you are. There must be transformations, there must be migrations. You will literally be changed into another man. Literally be changed into another man. God will ordain you a king 
from your mother's womb but when you come to the junction of ordination you will be changed into another man this is why we beseech him every day this is why we look upon him every day because we know that the dimensions of God we must host the quality of service we must render it is not the we that came to him we host that dimension the versions of us that host dimensions of God are the versions that go through processes and are transformed in the process the pastor Judah that is doing what he's doing today is not the same pastor Judah of two years ago these possibilities of God were installed in him before he was born but the manifestation is a product of his degree of transformation most of you here we herald moves of the spirit most of you will represent kingdom in different spheres but i tell you the you that we herald the move the you that we host dimensions the you that we represent the kingdom is not this one we are looking at the you that men will come to is not this one it's not the father mass teacher that is gathering this crowd I tell you the truth the father mass teacher can afford to teach 30 students but the man that will lead Obamosho the man that will lead Nigeria is not a father mathematics teacher I tell you the truth in Christ Jesus take me deeper deeper in love with you Jesus hold me close in your embrace take me deeper deeper than I've ever been before I just want to Before I became a preacher rebellion ignorance arrogance all of those things were chiseled in many years I was prayed in I was prayed to the platform this microphone I'm, I'm handling I was prayed to handle it ministry is the last thing I dreamt of I never saw it in my visions There are things I want to share with you this morning. It's not enough to say you've seen Jesus. There are many people changing this world. They've never seen the Lord. And there are many who have seen the Lord. They are nowhere. If you don't take this matter serious, you'll be amazed that in your old age, you will tell people the stories of your encounters. And only your children will call you a great man. Have you read such citations? Daddy was a great man. He was a mighty man. But the testimony is only in the family. The sentiment. Truth is that you are great. But never expressed it. Born relevant. Never manifested. Because you violated a lot of things. There are things that you must imbibe. To become everything that God wants you to be. The best prayer any man can pray for you is to become manifestly everything Jesus died for for you to become. Sometimes it takes a lifetime. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I think one of you will carry your microphone and sit down. You can see that my voice is bastardized. So somebody carry your microphone, sit down. If any song comes to my spirit, just lead it so you don't keep are we together? So you don't keep running around. I need you to also be blessed. So you can have the microphone and sit down and help me from there. Usually, the way it works for me is that if my voice is bad, it's hard for me to secure the anointing. My utterance is weak when I
You know, you encourage the preacher most time. <laughs> That's on a lighter note. Glory to Jesus. Last night we began to contemplate some of the dimensions of God that will hit our world very soon. And the strategies of the Spirit that are being marshaled out both from the realm of God and from the demonic realm. It's not only God that plans. It's not only God that strategizes. The devil works very, very hard, I assure you. The Bible said he roams like a roaring lion. If your eyes open and you see demons on assignment, you will discover that even the most serious of us is very lazy. I've seen it a couple of times. I've seen demons try to force people to do things they don't want. And if you see the way they jump around people, you'll be amazed. See that thought, that compelling thought you are having to call the lady, to call the lady. If you know how many pictures they showed you, if you know how many whispers, you will see a demon cling to somebody's ear. Call her now, call her now, call her. <laughs> You'll be amazed. <laughs> so the devil is on assignment. And I showed us three global strategies that the devil is bringing into the world. It's already begun, but it's going to be intensified in this season. The strategy of encroachment to besiege us until he zeroes us into oblivion. The strategy of infiltration to bring error, sin, iniquity, and treachery into everything we do so that our internal energy is depleted and we can no longer rise. Even when we know the ability to bring forth will be lacking. And then the strategy of suffocation using authorities that be to choke and to suppress our conviction until nobody can cry restore. For this cause, I told us that the Holy Ghost will be baptizing the body of Christ again with the spirit of martyrdom. Many rugged and dogged men will rise without fear of death. Men without the agenda of self-preservation that are willing to contend with the enemy at the gate. Such men will rise. I said the Lord is raising three quadrants. Missionaries. Who are men that we go out there to bring the counsel of God to the body and even to the gates of the enemy. Intercessors and cave dwellers who will generate continuously spiritual power and territorial atmosphere that is suitable for advancing the kingdom. And then songs of consolation with enormous business strategy and understanding in wealth creation and influence to facilitate fast track and to advance the kingdom through their resources. It's not a time to talk against prosperity. It's not a time to talk against prayer. And it's not a time to talk against missions. It's a triangular strategy of God to address everything the devil is bringing to the world. And most of you will find yourself having burdens in line with these three dimensions of God, of God's operation. Some of you will have burdens for souls, burdens to reach out, burdens to go out there and defend the integrity of the kingdom. Most of you will have burdens for prayer. Most of you will have burdens for wealth. But I told us that the first parameter of God that will be introduced in order to keep us within the region of safety and accuracy is the parameter of death. If death is not introduced, you will call your ambition ministry. You will call your appetite for wealth kingdom advancement strategy. And then you will call your laziness waiting on the Lord. So God will bring death in different layers. And I told us that Jesus, who happens to be the pattern man, experienced death at different layers in order to bring the kingdom to different extents and enough to host the possibilities of the kingdom that is ready and needed by the human race. Every one of us must be introduced to death. Paul will say he died daily. What is he dying to? He's dying to the flesh. He's dying to lust. He's dying to ambitions, tendencies that makes him want to take the glory. Tendencies that make him want to call his appetite and ambition the work of the kingdom. And if we don't do that, we may end up building systems that have the emblem of our name 
and our ancestry and it will not have the emblem of the kingdom. It's important for us to know that there's nothing wrong in building churches. There's nothing wrong in buying things that are needed for the kingdom. But death is the only dividing line that will separate our ambition from kingdom advancement. This is why it is needful for us to embrace death. I don't know how to emphasize this much more than I've done yesterday, but I was sure in my spirit last night that that emphasis was not only communicated cognitively, it was also imparted as a body of truth. And most of you that left here yesterday, you would realize that you have made new resolutions. You realize you have received new abilities to stand for God and God alone. You would realize that you have been stripped of many appetites and many ambitions. How many of you had such experience last night? You see that. You may not understand completely, cognitively, everything that was communicated. But I tell you the truth, there are many appetites that have died. There are many addictions that have died. There are many ambitions that have been choked. And this morning I come to bring another layer. Because virtually every one of us will be ministers in the last day. Not five-fold ministers per se, but ministers of reconciliation. Bringing the world, bringing Jesus to the world at different levels, at different spheres, at different strata. But we will definitely be ministers. In our offices, in our marketplaces, in governmental platforms, we will all be ministers. So it's important for these things to be known. It's important for these things to become our realities. Death daily, dying daily, must become your reality. Every time your ambition come up, God will remind you. It's, a, it's like an alarm. You can't hide it. I went for a meeting on the campus. And after ministry, that was recently, I've checked my heart many times and I'm certain I don't have ambition for money. But I went for a meeting and they didn't have honorarium for me. Actually, they made a payment for a flight and it was cancelled and all of that. In fact, I had to add money to pay for my flight, my return ticket. And while I was leaving, they said, thank you, sir. So I felt in my heart to teach them. You know, sometimes you say you want to teach, but there is a strand somewhere in your heart because you will not realize you have an expectation. I'm pouring my heart to you so that you will know and be helped. And then I called the guy to teach him. Whereas my expectation also was turned down because naturally you will expect something. So I was not turning my expectation as well. And when I called them, I told them, even if you don't have, the honorable thing to do is to explain your situation to the man of God and tell the man of God, we had this challenge, we had this challenge. So at the time, we may not have anything to give. But we have a leading in our hearts that God wants you to bless us. So the man of God will prepare himself and not be stranded. And when I said that to them and left, two weeks later, I was going for a meeting and the Holy Ghost told me, don't receive anything they have to offer. I said, Lord, you know what I did. I did with a perfect heart. <laughs> you know I was teaching this <laughs> I was teaching these people with a perfect heart I had no ambition he said don't take honorarium again what I'm a young preacher starting out you say don't take I don't understand father what is the plan What is? tell me the other part that I don't know <laughs> and then I traveled for another meeting and the night before I left, he said, remember not to take anything. Meanwhile, at this time, more than 70% of my meetings are campus meetings. And you are telling me if I go for a meeting that has to do with the campus, if the person is a campus preacher or a fellowship on campus, I shouldn't take on a radio. Amen. We are still praying on that matter. Me and him, are, we are still discussing. <laughs> because at this time, I want to know the exact timing. When should I start? 
But you don't know the language of death until the Holy Ghost begins to travel with you. These things are beyond doctrines. They are consecrations. God will show you a lot of things so that your heart becomes strong. That was why Paul began to learn trust in another dimension when he was carried through this, the corridor of death. Death is a language every one of us must understand. Every one of us. We must understand it. Every one of us. This morning I want to show us the second layer. It's called spiritual growth. When you die, you begin to grow. Every area of your life, you embrace death. It becomes another frontier for growth. If you don't truly embrace death, it will be difficult to grow. As important as growth is, death is the ground, the preparatory ground for growth in the kingdom. There are many things in God you will not know. There are many experiences in God you will not have. There are many dimensions of the kingdom you will not enter until you begin to die at different levels. It's a precursor for growth in the kingdom. A lot of people have visions. They have understanding of what to do. They don't just know why they cannot grow. Jesus will say, except the corn of wheat falls to the ground and die. It abides alone. Growth begins where death is experienced. Because the eternal life of God does not grow side by side with the life of the flesh. Flesh will always resist eternal life. So eternal life is empowered where death is embraced. Kingdom growth is too important in the dispensation where we are in. In Isaiah chapter 3, the Bible will say when God wants to leave a people vulnerable, if you want to see a people that are vulnerable, the Bible says he will make children their leaders. People that don't know when last they grew up, they will be on the microphone. They will be in leadership emphasizing things preposiously with audacity they don't have understanding of what they don't know they'll be telling others with so much audacity at the end of the day all of them will be crumbled you see somebody that have not experienced a dimension in God talking about it audaciously that's why both him and the people listening have no experience the reason is not because they have not studied the reason is because it's not because they've not heard about it. The reason is because there is something in them resisting it. They've not given attention to that thing. But they want to talk about dimensions. You don't enter it by saying it. You enter it because you are being carried. In this kingdom, everything we experience is a carriage. Even prayer. You'll be shocked when you begin to do business on the altar that you can't pray until you are helped. So a man who prays is a man that has understood the economy of help. A man who travels in the spirit is a man that has understood the economy of the carriage of the spirit. So in this kingdom, if there's anything to look out for, is growth. Growth is not open doors. Growth is not being known everywhere. Growth is not talking about things you heard. Growth is your increase in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Many don't pay attention to this. This is why they go nowhere in the kingdom. It's possible for a man to use different strategy to gather people, yet himself and the people will be infants. God wants to do something in the land. He's still looking for the people in the cave. You will wonder why the churches are increasing, the number is increasing, but God can't find men. It's because growth is lacking. We are massive in number, but we are few in stature. Many kingdom responsibilities cannot be committed because the moment it's committed, self rises up. 
You think the guy is dead until fame comes. You think the guy is dead until money comes. When you hear what ministers, most times I like to use ministers so that we will begin judgment from the household of God. If you hear pastors gather and talk, you'll be amazed. The plans and the agenda that we have is terrifying. Everything is a revelation of flesh, self ambition, self preservation, self exhortation, self glorification. But we polish it with excellence, polish it with all kinds of things, but the truth is we are not growing. That's why our prayers have no territorial implication. That's why our intercession have no territorial implication. The apostles will gather, lift their voices in one accord and pray. And instantly, you will hear the Bible say they were furnished with boldness. Boldness was lacking. They were flogged, threatened not to preach in the name of Jesus. They gathered and prayed. Instantly, boldness was downloaded. And the Bible will say with great grace, with great grace, God bore the apostles witness of the resurrection of Christ. Instantly, power and territorial dominion came. So much so that the Bible will say the, the influence they commanded caused the whole city to gather at the apostles' feet. The people that were threatened, there was a ripple effect in the spirit. And the Bible will say there was none among them that lacked. Just because they gathered and prayed. Why is it that we have fasting for one month? Yet there is no migration. We just feel excited. There is no territorial shift. We just feel excited. How come people don't necessarily migrate with all the activity? We are truly not growing. We just stay at one location doing the same thing we are doing, exciting ourselves and motivating ourselves. When was the last time our evangelical mandate is able to wreck the Islamic world? When was the last time? we came for fellowship and then we said this lady was an islamic person but i spoke to her she came to the church when was the last time we spoke and things shifted and you see that a measure of darkness upon the land was shifted you come to the campus people are dressing naked they are continually dressing naked you come to the campus exam my practice is ongoing it continues like that you come to the campus, sickness of all kinds, it continues like that. No territorial power. Because the men doing business are children. We think it's about the microphone. We think it's about new rema. We think it's about being known. It's about posters and flyers. We don't grow. When we begin to grow, every one of us will begin to look like Jesus. Jesus himself, with every spiritual resource, needed to grow in luke chapter 2 verse 40 the bible said the child jesus the child the child the emphasis is on the word child he is jesus but he is child he is lord but he is child he is master but he is child he said the child jesus grew the child jesus grew you can be an apostle but you can be the child apostle you can be a prophet, but you are a child prophet. Until we begin to grow in this kingdom, we cannot hold the dimensions that the, the world needs to see in order to be transformed. Our problem is not our message. Our problem is not our dress code. Our problem is not our coordination. Our problem is not the level of our education. Our problem is the measure of our growth. The fullness of the stature of Christ is lacking. The evangelism strategy is there. The prayer meetings are there. Beautiful and important. Excellence, too important. He said, make garments unto Aaron for beauty and for glory. Even God can't withstand a shabby person. So when we preach that, it's not shabbiness. That's why we dress well. So we are not saying death is poverty. We are not saying death is shabbiness. No. We are saying death is complete annihilation to the old man. Experientially bringing the old man to his knees so that the spirit man that is created after the life of God takes preeminence at all times. 
growth. How much growth have you experienced? I know you are called. I know you are a preacher. I know you are skilled in the word of righteousness. But how much growth have you experienced? If we come to live in your house, are we going to see the preacher, the excellent man of God on the pulpit? Are we going to see that same man of God every day? This is why most times when men get married, that's when you will know whether they are men of God. Every dimension that was locked up on the pulpit and managed, you can't manage it at home. You can't manage it. Most times, the reason people stay away is not because they are waiting on God. I know a lot of preachers that are not seen anywhere. When you go home, they are either watching a movie or they are chatting or they are playing video game. Forget it. That they are out of sight does not mean they are in God's presence. But if you come close, you are going to see flesh. So the best thing to do is to lock away. You can't come close because if you come close, your faith will collapse. The man that encouraged your faith so much, you now went to do retreat in himself for one week. When you come back, you say, Oh boy, <laughs> it's in easy. I think the thing is in a lie. This is why most times you will find the most healthy Christians the day they give their hearts to Christ. The more they are churched, the more they become like the devil. He said, You travel land and sea to make a proselyte, but you make him twice the son of hell. People are more on fire and more accurate. The week they gave their hearts to Christ. Come back to church after two years and meet them. You will be sure. Because they met so many children in the body of Christ. And they discovered they don't have to be holy after all. They don't have to be righteous after all. Secret purity is not really a necessity. All you know to do is package well. Coordinate well. And at the end of the day we can state manage the service. There is no true growth. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 The Bible will say Every one of us have received grace According to the measure of the gift Of Christ The gift of Christ That life Was communicated to you Without any effort You did nothing to receive it But from verse 8 Him that descended Is the same that ascended on high And he led captivity Captive he led captive in his train and he gave some from verse 11 to be apostles to be prophets to be evangelists to be pastors and teachers why? for the perfecting of the saints you have received the gift of Christ but you need to grow into the fullness of Christ for the perfecting of the saints the word perfecting is the word katadismos it means to be equipped with light for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until it's a process, until we all come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Growth is not a thing that we can look away from. If you are serving in the kingdom for 10 years and you have not migrated, there's a problem. A point will come when the devil will promote you. The devil will announce you. The devil will give you influence. Because all the people that will come under your umbrella, you will make them become like yourself. This is why our focus is not promotion. Our focus is not announcement. They are byproducts. If we grow, then everybody that comes under our radar is safe. If we don't grow, our influence becomes a trap. And the devil will use it to enslave a generation. This is why you can be praying for anointing. God is dealing with you. Because there is a dimension of Christ that you need to host. There is a measure of Christ that you need to host. If these things are not there, there will be a challenge with your consciousness. You will do everything you are doing. You will be heading in another direction. When you pray, what is your consciousness? When you study, what is your consciousness? You don't know that the level of accreditation you receive in heaven is not a function of what you are doing it's a function of your growth because your growth will help you to mirror Christ in your prayer to mirror Christ in your word to mirror Christ in your singing to mirror Christ in everything you do this is why your message is not as important as yourself 
It is the extent of Christ you host that determines the quality of your message. The quality of your message is not how intelligent it sounds. The quality of your message is the measure of life communicated. Jesus will say, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they too might be sanctified. So when Jesus come to minister, he said, the words you have heard have cleansed you. The man who is talking to you is purged. So you can't hear him and not be purged. So the power of the message is in the level of purging that the one preaching carries. Paul said, for that we are affectionately desirous of you, 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, we did not only communicate to you the gospel, but we impacted the substance of our soul. This is why you can go to a place, somebody is preaching righteousness, but you live there, you are fornicating. He's preaching the fear of God, you live there, you are fornicating. The reason is because he's still playing with carnal things. So even though he emphasizes a dimension with audacity, you can't find yourself doing it. He's talking about the fear of God, but the people are godless. Sometimes I go to certain places, not to smite anybody now, but especially prophetic ministries. Hell is free! Hell is free! <laughs> As if they are not aware of hell. Hell is free! God is coming soon. Nobody preaches the last day gospel like prophets. But if you mingle with them, if you mingle, ah, thank God we have prophets that are teaching priests. <laughs> Proof. I am saying this thing again and again so that something will shift in your mind. Your focus will no longer be how many people are gathered. Your focus will no longer be where am I invited to. Your focus is not how many people know me. Your focus now will become how much of Christ is formed on my inside. You can leave a meeting, the power of God move, but you went back to Jesus, you are not even aware. Your focus is the approver of heaven. You left a meeting, the power of God move, and while you are stepping out, God is troubling you. That statement you made, you exaggerated it. And throughout the night, you are there troubling with the Holy Ghost and until the Holy Ghost recalibrates you. Both you and the Holy Ghost, nobody is talking about what happened in the meeting. It is the little exaggeration. So God is more interested in the quality of Christ on your inside than the magnitude of work you are doing on the outside. If the quality of Christ on the inside is not correct, the work outside is error, no matter how large it is. We must grow in God. We must grow in God. We must grow in God. And we must make it deliberate. Growth is deliberate. Sometimes the reason you eat is not because you feel like eating. Even when you are sick, you have no appetite. You know you have to eat. Because if you don't eat, this, this reality, you will be deleted from it. So in order to stay relevant in this reality, you must most times you exercise, not because you like it. Any area you want to grow in, there are definite articles that makes for growth. You are, you are an athlete. You must run every day, not because you like it. Sometimes they are running with music in their ear because they need something that will just keep them distracted from the rigor. Not because they want to hear the song, but they must have to run if they will grow in what they are doing. So it's a deliberate thing. And I want to show you certain deliberate installations that you must put around your life every day in order to grow in the life and the nature of God. There are three major gates that must be secured by every generation. If we must trap host and express the heritage of God. I know I'm being calm this morning, but I want something to become life applicable. I want something to be imparted consciously into your life. Three that must be watched and secured. 
every time a generation begins to make headway is because they are preserving these three gates the first is the gate of knowledge if our knowledge is defied everything we are doing is wrong this is why accuracy can never be overemphasized Luke we said in Luke chapter 1 from verse 1 in as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things that are most surely believed among us are you hearing his choice of words to set forth in order that means truth not just littered here and there carefully coordinated to set forth in order the things that are most surely believed among us even as they were committed to us he didn't say they were taught to us he didn't say they were spoken to us he didn't say they were revealed to us he said they were committed that means this man came to a point where they could handle it now i am a com i am in committer of those dimensions so when i come to talk to you i am coming to commit to you purity i'm coming to commit to you power i'm coming to commit to you wisdom i'm coming to commit to you life i have handled it so the quality of their discipleship was not necessarily determined by their number it was determined by dimensions that they hosted he said we that are bringing this message we are host to dimensions these things were committed paul will say to timothy in first timothy chapter 2 verse 2 he said the things you have received from me before many witnesses the same commit to faithful men so it's not just a teaching it's a definite dimension of god that a man can trap and relate it's a kind of knowledge that this man had about God. They preserved its purity from generation to generation. This is why most times, when certain emphasis, I came in when Reverend Tolu was talking about authority and order. You may think it's not important. You may think power is important until you become so anointed and you become an agent of Satan. Till tomorrow, many prophets will go to hell not because they meant it but because Balaam pioneered the way disorderliness lawlessness till tomorrow that anointing has a virus till tomorrow it was Balaam that pioneered the dimension of gain as godliness it was Balaam that pioneered the way of wardom in the prophetic he said God you can't fight these people just cause them to sin against their God. Their God will begin to fight them. It's a wisdom that was locked up away from mortars. Balaam unlocked it. That's why the way of Jezebel and the way of Gain is the error of the prophetic till today. So long as that anointing, if that anointing comes upon your life, you must fight those two gates. It will sneak into your life whether you like it or not. Unless you come under government. So when a man is emphasizing order, you don't know what he's talking about until a kind of dimension an anointing wants to work in your life that's when you will see the necessity that you can be a prophet but you are walking in the way of Bela first it was a doctrine it became a way so many prophets have found it because order is not emphasized this is why growth and growth in the right direction is too important but for us to grow we must keep the gate of knowledge and when i'm saying knowledge i'm talking about the experiential knowledge of god you grow in it prayer will bring you into that knowledge study will bring you in but a custodian must communicate it so there are many that have been raised to communicate and to keep the gate of knowledge when you hear apostle fighting doctrines fighting things it's not because you want to be a controversial person. 
if you stay around him, you know he's a meek man. But he has the responsibility of keeping the gate of knowledge. God will trouble you and force you into a particular lifestyle. The reason is because you are a gatekeeper. A gate of knowledge. John said that which was from the beginning. Which we heard, we saw, we looked upon, and our hands handled of the word of life. He said that is what we've come to commit to you. Knowledge. The body of Christ cannot grow unless we have access to accurate knowledge. The knowledge of God. If there is anything you are doing, if there is anything you know that does not translate to more of Christ in you, it means that knowledge is wrong. That's what I'm trying to say. Everything you do that is within the boundary of accurate insight, we bring the fullness of Christ alive on your inside. This is why it begins with you before it begins without. If it is not manifesting in you, everything happening around is a charade. Remember, Jesus came casting out demons. They said he did it by Beelzebub. So you can scream and people fall down. The devil is encouraging you in your error. You came to the platform from the altar of immorality. And yet you say, Hold! And things happen. And you say you have power. You don't know the demons cooperating with you. If you see them, you will stop preaching for one year. The knowledge of God is a gate that every generation must preserve. The second gate is a gate of interaction. Ability to connect to the Holy Spirit and download the dimensions of heaven. Truth is progressive. Realities are released as packets. God, the Bible says, light. Light is communicated in packets. There are many things our fathers knew, worked with. It was enough to tame darkness in their world. If we must conquer in our generation, we must constantly interact with heaven. We can trap realities here, teach them, and bring men into it. But there's another layer. We must teach men how to access the spirit realm. You must hear the Holy Ghost for yourself. You must know the voice of God. And you must follow the leading of God. If a generation is healthy and the man of God is accurate, everything he says from here is a confirmation. Everything he tells you is a confirmation. But we are stunted. So everything that comes from the Bible is a remnant. You can hear somebody preach a message and you are shocked. This is what God was telling me last week. How come? In fact, can men will gather and say you listen to that person. They don't know what's happening. They don't understand the game of interaction. You can come to church and you hear reverend minister and you say, ah, is that not what God was telling me last night? It will make the work easy. So every time a generation must be held in they must labor to enter into the economy of interaction. Everybody must hear the Holy Ghost for himself. If we don't hear the Holy Ghost from our, for ourselves, we can be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Remember, doctrine is the boundary for preserving our heritage in God. But doctrine can become a dogma if men don't hear God. Ten churches can be talking about prayer. But ten churches are using prayer to fulfill ten different ambitions. It's a dogma. The only way we can stay accurate is when everybody hears God. And if everybody hears God, we become careful. That's why you see the minister is on fire when he's talking to youth. But when he comes for minister's conference, he's guided. <laughs> you can scream and say anything you want to say when you are on the campus. But if you come have you gone for a meeting before? They say, give a charge for five minutes and your heart begins to pan. <laughs> is it not the same you that is the man of Rema? Suddenly you came for a meeting. They say, um, uh, you give a charge for five minutes. You start, God help me. God help me. What do I say? What do I say? 
Because you know everybody there is current. <laughs> this is why we must grow. When we grow, we become current in the spirit. If the guy comes and says something, say no now. Um, I respect you, but what you are saying? Then you now see people begin to ask themselves, how far? That thing he said, what, what do you think? What? <laughs> when everybody is alive in the spirit, our walk with God becomes faster and more effective. So, our, we must preserve the gate of interaction. We must teach men how to link up with the Holy Spirit. Because every one of us is a child of God. It's not the apostle who is the child of God. Every one of us. We have eternal life. We must walk from that economy. The gate of interaction. If you see a generation going in error, interaction is lacking. People don't hear God anymore. They till to fables. In the days of Eli, the Bible said the word of God was cars. They were reciters of the Torah. Keepers of the laws of Moses. They understood the Tanakh. But the voice of God was cars. So they could afford to drift into error. But one man came that understood interaction. He began by keeping with the emphasis on ground. Studying the Torah. But there was something more. He said in 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 7. He said the voice of God had not yet been revealed to Samuel. The guy was a reciter of the Torah. One of the laws of priesthood is to dwell on the Torah until you become a custodian of the Torah because you will need to instruct Israel. Keeper of the laws of Moses but the voice of God, the word of the Lord had not yet been what? Revealed. Because you don't only teach, you must connect to heaven. And in 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 21, he said, the Lord appeared again to Samuel in Shiloh. The Lord revealed himself in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. When interaction begins, life flows through the word. This is why we mustn't teach everything. God gives people different messages for their generation. One may teach faith all his life. One may teach alignment all his life. One may teach prayer all his life. At the end of the day, if the Lord appear again in Shiloh, the Lord will reveal himself by the word of the Lord. So you can know the fullness of God by understanding faith. You can know the fullness of God by understanding prayer. The reason is because there is a link up to heaven. This is when God established Samuel. In verse 20 of that scripture, he said, the people of Israel knew of certainty that God had established Samuel. A man who has no connection can never be established. Never. Because you can easily drift into error. God knows that one day you can wake up and because you want to buy a plane, you will now come and say, we will give now for the kingdom. We will give. You cannot, the restraint of the Holy Ghost is not there because there is no interaction. The government of the Holy Ghost is not there because there is no interaction. The guy needs to get money to do what he wants to do and all of a sudden, he came online and put his account number. The work of God have need. What is the need of the work of God? He needs to buy the latest iPhone because the worker of God is part of the work of God. No restraint. There must be connection. And thirdly, we must preserve the gate of good character. Your anointing is worthless until we can see the God that power you through your lifestyle. Because cultures are revelations of predominant influences. When you see a predominant character, it's a revelation of the spirit governing the life. The souls of men are processors and they traffic dimensions of spirits. If you see a man perpetually living a kind of life, know that the Holy Ghost is not the only person operating him. There's a predominant operating system that his life is giving expression to. His life is a monitor that reveals the spirit that rules over him. 
So the gate of character must be preserved. We must teach it. We must emphasize it. Emphasize it. We must watch over it. The lady may be the most anointed, but if there are consistent patterns and error in her character, she should rest from the choir for a while. It's better we go without choir than have somebody emitting spiritual dimensions that will frustrate the move of God. Your character is a revelation of the spirit governing your life. Your character is a revelation of the realm where your soul is functioning from. Your character is the screen, the theater, the monitor that reveals to us the happenings in your soul. The gate of character must be preserved. It is wiser to emphasize character until a people grow in God than to emphasize an anointing where a people are characterless. They will become tools in the hands of the devil. This is why we emphasize growth. Because God cannot be communicated to a generation unless the vessels communicating God become conduits that God can interact with. The God that is not one with you cannot be revealed through you. So the growing in the fullness of the measure of Christ is an alarm that our generation must hear. Many people want to spring out because an angel appeared to them. How much of God is in your life? Many people want to spring out because they can call somebody's name, call his location. How much of God can be seen through your life? Many people want to spring out because now they can pray in tongues for six hours. They can exhort a people. They can give a charge. They can give rema. But when you come around, our society is godless. A revelation of the quality of our Christianity. If you want to understand and judge the accuracy and the quality of our Christianity, look at our environment. It reveals to a large extent, a large extent, the kind of energy that we are emitting. Jesus met fishermen, he met tax collectors, all kinds of people. When they drew close to him, they could not distinguish them. Judas needed to kiss Jesus to say he's the one. He had the ability to condition everybody around him to become like him. Growth makes all of that happen. John was on fire, full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. But the Bible said in Luke 1 80, he was in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. Growing in stature, in the fullness of God. So when he came, even though he had fire, he still had the approval of heaven. Jesus will come and point at John and say, of all men born of a woman, there is none greater than John. He was a burning and a shining light. You were willing to stay under his light for a season. Growth is an alarm that our generation must hear. Because there are too many babes venturing into hallowed grounds. There are too many babes laying their hands on hallowed realities. There are too many babes taking stones that they don't need to take. And they are dislocating many people from their destinies. We must come back and grow. We must come back and access our life and tell ourselves the truth. How much of Jesus does your life represent? I know you are a good teacher. I know you are a preacher. I know you are gifted. But how much of Jesus can we see in your life? He said the believers were first called Christians in Antioch. Because when they saw them beyond their preaching, they could identify Jesus in their lives. When men look upon you, can they find Jesus? If you were not preaching for a second, can people see Jesus through your life? The preacher meets somebody that is in need and his response shows that there is no compassion in his life. Sometimes you have to edit a lot of things because if you see him in his element, you will be amazed. Somebody show up with cancer. Say, get up! Can't you see that I'm busy? Eh? <laughs> 
That's the man of God that comes on stage and he sees the sick. He lays hands and says, Be healed. Let the sick meet him at home. That time is no longer the gift at work, it's the character of Christ. Then you will realize he has no time for anybody. The man of God that you see on stage and say, uh, Three widows, call three widows and give them 50, 50,000. Wait until they meet him at home and say they have a need. That's when you realize that everything on the altar is a showpiece. Everything is state managed. You think he has love? If you check your life, you will know you have no love. The guy can save money to give for partnership, but he can never give to anybody that has a need around him. The reason is because at the end of the year, they call the top 100 partners. And he must be among the top 100 partners. Because that's the night of wearing the shiny suit. And when he comes out as number one partner, uh, we have burden for the people. Is it the people you have burden for? How many beggars have you given to? Your friends that have need, how many have you given to? I've lived in a house. I've stayed with people that are pastors. My brother, I know compassion is a far cry. nature of Jesus is lacking. That's why the quality of our message is weak. There's no generation that is as knowledgeable as our generation, but the impact is low because Jesus is not communicated in what we say. There is so much intelligence, there is so much rhema, there is so much grammar, but there is little spirit. Jesus is not communicated. We must grow. And to grow, these three gates must be preserved. There are six things that make for growth in the kingdom. That I want to share with us this morning. You know, next time you pray, I know you are a man of prayer. But as you are praying before you are sent, some of the things the Holy Ghost points out in your life, deal with them in prayer before you are sent. It will help you a great deal. A great deal. It will help you. Next time you respond to people when you are not in church. I know all of us are modest in church. I know all of us are kind. In fact, if we are ushers, we smile at everybody. But when you go to the market, when you go to the lecture hall, be careful to look for those characters if they are still there. What do you do under pressure? Check. They are revelatory of the depth of God in, your, in you and the measure of growth in your life. Never assess yourself by what you do when you are ministering. Always assess yourself by what you do when you are caught off guard. The more of God revealed when you are caught off guard is a statement of your growth in Christ. And every time you are caught off guard and you are wrong, don't be in a hurry to put it aside. Go back to God on that matter and tell him to help you. Six things that makes for growth very quickly. One, they are the things you know, but I want to show you some other things that should inform your consciousness. The first one is prayer. Prayer is not screaming, prayer is not shouting at God. You know, somehow, unconsciously, we have reduced the potency of spiritual things because we are under pressure to perform. If you become truly honest with yourself, you will know. We have reduced the potency of spiritual things because we are under pressure to perform. When you are leading prayer, 
when you are praying in your closet when you are praying wherever it is you are praying honestly what are the things you watch out for what are the things you want to see your motivation is revelatory of your level of growth your expression are largely revelatory of your measure of growth there can be many activities around your life but little approvals from heaven you can come and scatter everywhere but God have not showed up hope you know when Elijah was praying there was an earthquake hope you know when Elijah was praying there was a mighty wind hope you know when Elijah was praying there was fire but Elijah was not carried away the reason is because he has done business with God for a long time so he knew what he was waiting for he was waiting for communication most of us shout at God when we pray but we don't hear the still small voice meanwhile that voice that comes from heaven is what makes the difference in your prayer you can pray for six hours but you didn't make contact you can pray for seven days you didn't make contact and you can end that prayer and make it a, a subject in your preaching last month I was in the place of prayer for seven days for 12 hours every day that's the goal of your prayer and it's mundane when we started the year we went on 12 days of prayer and dry fast and the Lord was gracious the Lord was gracious what did God say what are the matching orders what are the new measures none to show but you came because you wanted to build the stature of your message and your message need to come with your new stunt in the spirit I was in the mount in Babalola mountain last month and um, by the grace of God we prayed for money tonight for three days and uh, I'm showing us things so that we know that under it the rema, we are liars. I'm showing us things so that we know that under it the courage, we are deceived. We don't judge and vet our motivations. And a lot of young preachers are joining in this part of error. Under pressure to do a lot of things. You want to start your own fellowship because the last time you preach, you check, you didn't see any difference with what was happening when the Lord was preaching. And when he was preaching, people were shouting. Man, as I was preaching, they were standing. They could not even sit down. The fire was so much, the voice might not be in the fire. When I was praying, people were falling down. And when I checked, the people that fell down were even more. And when he, when he was praying, what do you mean? Is it that we don't know God? Can't we pray? Can't we pray? How much of Jesus do you have? What the world is, is in need of is Christ. It's not a new message. What the world is in need of is Jesus. It's not a new doctrine. It's not a dogma. The measure of Christ that can be communicated is how much of him is downloaded in the place of prayer. So when next you go to pray, find God. When next you go to pray, wait for a download. If there's no download, you may be sure that you are exercising yourself at the level where you were. What makes for migration? What makes for a shift? What makes for enlargement? Is the download of heaven. That's why two people pray, their results are different. Because one is praying to have a new message. Another one is largely looking for God. So he sees him every morning. I studied Exodus. And I was sure that many times Moses would be on the mountain for days. And when I began to check the Bible critically, his prayer points were few. His God has spoke the most. Have you checked it out? Many times Moses only asked questions. Or many times Moses brought the burden of the people. There were a few times Moses went to God and he was an orator. He was either asking a question 
or communicating his insufficiencies or bringing the burden and the needs of the people God spoke most in Moses' prayer altar because Moses is a man that is looking for the download of God. Our generation is bereft of the measure of Christ. But we are full of messages. We are full of gestures. We are full of dimensions, dramatic dimensions on altars. This is why there are no results. A generation of praying men must rise again. What happens to you when you begin to pray the kingdom kind of prayer? I'm being careful not to delve into priesthood because I know a said man over the house he has a throne there. But I want, I want to emphasize things that will make for your growth because my focus this morning is true spiritual growth. And I've already benchmarked growth to be the measure of Christ that is what formed your inside. When we begin to pray, the first thing that happens is that God begins to bring stability to our work with Him. Stability. A man who is growing is a man that has stability. He's not up today and down tomorrow, he's not falling today and rises tomorrow. I know the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times. He will rise seven times. But don't be falling all your life. Thank God the Bible says seven times. So don't fall ten times in a week. When prayer begins to take root in your life, what will happen is that there will be stability. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, certain desires to have you, to sift you like wheat. He said, but I have prayed. That your faith faileth not. When thou art recovered, strengthen thy brethren. You will think Jesus just decided to invoke that dimension. That was what Jesus did all his life. The reason Jesus had stability in his work was because he gave himself to prayer. The apostles learned it eventually. And they will say, we will not give ourselves to tables. But we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the world because they know the reason they are continuously representing the kingdom is because prayer had become a lifestyle not an act not an activity a lifestyle you will pray until prayer takes roof on your inside then stability will be one of the byproducts you will find yourself growing upward and forward only People will think situations will knock you down, but you'll be standing. They will not be able to explain it. The reason is because prayer has become a lifestyle. If there is an alarm that the body of Christ needs to hear today, is the alarm of prayer. Prayer, not for show. Prayer, not activity. Prayer, a lifestyle. Many people are preachers today, but they are not prayer warriors. They are not intercessors. They have no business with the altar. Not one. Dressing up in different colors of suits with different ch charms of messages, but no prayer. If there is a marching order that the church must receive today, is the marching order of prayer. That prayer must become a lifestyle. It must be beyond you carrying out a particular activity to achieve a particular purpose. It must be beyond you coming with a prayer request to receive an answer from God must become a lifestyle. So every time you focus, every time you nurture that hunger, you can leave a meeting and then you are set on fire. Three days you are praying every day and then something happens. The devil does not come for you. The devil does not come for the impartation. The devil does not come from the, for the anointing or for the gifts that you receive in that meeting. The devil will come for that fire. That prayer power you receive that made it easy for you to wake up around 12 midnight to pray. The devil will come for it. And after three days you discover that it became a struggle. Everything you got from that meeting is lost. Stability is on the altar of prayer. And Jesus mirrored it as a pattern. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible said, 
the Holy Ghost led him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Jesus will come back from that mountain hotter, stronger, and more violent. Why? He went on 40 days prayer and fasting. Before the devil came, Jesus prayed. That was why when he sensed that the devil was coming for Peter, he didn't advise him. He knew the cure of prayer. He was going to the cross. It was a struggle. He didn't consult with anybody. He prayed. He would have absconded mission. He needed to pray. So stability in the kingdom is only necessitated or quickened rather when prayer becomes a lifestyle. Every time your life of prayer is attacked, your destiny is about to be swallowed up. Every time your life of prayer is attacked, your fire is about to be lost. Every time your prayer is attacked, you are about to lose your calling. You may have a message, you may have a platform, but you are not part of those heaven is working with. You may have people listening to you, but you are no longer part of the army of heaven. You will be amazed that church can be going on on earth, but the candlestick has been removed from heaven. Prayer. There are few believers today that have prayer as a lifestyle. Few. And if we were revealed the percentage, we will be shocked. This massive number you see here, most of us are preachers. Most of us are heads of fellowship. Most of us have visions already of what God wants us to begin to do next week. We came for this conference to receive impartation to go and start. But if we check here, how many people have a life of prayer? You will be amazed that we will not be up to 10. There is no matching order if prayer has not been a lifestyle. The reason is because your life will not have stability. And if you don't have stability, the devil can come in any day and scatter everything. Reverend said, this walk will be seven years by, ne by Monday. You don't know what it means. Those are seven years of prayer. They are not seven years of preaching. What you see is preaching. But what stabilizes the walk is prayer. So if a generation needs to hear an alarm of heaven, then they need to hear the voice of prayer. A prayer not to meet needs, but a prayer as a walk in the spirit. The next thing prayer does is that it activates your seasons. Many will play too if they don't imbibe the culture of prayer. For those of us who are preachers, we know there are times when you become rusty. No matter how you try, you know that you are beginning to play too. If you want new seasons to open, then prayer must become consistent. You will think Jesus is the son of God. So he did everything he did by default mode. If you study the life of Jesus carefully, you will realize that Jesus depended on many spiritual wisdom, many spiritual strategies to do the things he did with perfection. 40 years, Jesus was comfortable doing his carpentry job. But he sensed that a season had come. The season will come with temptations. The season will come with instructions. The next thing Jesus did was that he migrated to the mountain. Why? Meanwhile, every morning, the Bible said in Mark 1.35, in the cool of the morning, Jesus went to the solitary place to pray. That's the son of God. That's the first fruit from the dead. That is the, the one that bears the fullness of the glory of the Father. Every day he lived, he began his day praying. And most times he ended his day praying on the mountain. To keep him afloat. And when seasons come, Jesus goes for protracted prayer. Every time a season comes, he goes for protracted prayer. These things don't sound like rema. These things don't sound exciting. But these are the secrets that many men stand on. Kingdom warrior. 
go and check his story, you will find all of these things. The devil, the Holy Ghost led him to the wilderness to be tempted and he went on 40 days fast and instantly he unlocks the season of his ministry. And the Bible will say he returned in the power of the Spirit. His fame went abroad. Why? He went to the synagogue as his custom was. He opened the, the Bible, the Torah, to read Luke chapter 6 verse 16. But this time around, everything was different. It was his custom to go to the synagogue. But this time, what he read, he read it in particular. He knew that the season had come. He was reading the Torah for many years. But he never dared say he was the one. But after he unlocked the season, he went and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach glad tidings. They thought he was reading, reading Isaiah so that you will read it over the people and you will bless them. And he said, this day is this script of fear before your eyes. He came from the mountain. Every season he unlocked, he unlocked by prayer. Let me tell you, you will receive a thousand and one impartation you will not know why you won't grow. Matthew chapter 8 verse 1. He returned from the mountain. And when the evening was come, 16, 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, they brought all that were sick and himself healed them. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, himself took away our infirmities. Seasons. How did he unlock it? He came down from the mountain. You are the only person not praying, but hoping that what you saw in the vision will manifest. You need to know that manifestation of different dimensions of God are locked into different layers of your growth. As you pray and sustain stability, you grow. And then as you pray, you unlock seasons over your life. Irresponsibility is the undoing of our generation. We are waiting for a prophet to come and say your seasons are open. You will hear it many, many times. Seasons. Matthew 17 verse 2. He went to the mountain after six days with Peter, James and John. As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. They appeared before him Moses and Elias and they talked to him about the kingdom and what he could do in Jerusalem. Seasons. You don't know why you are not growing according to the calendar of heaven. The foundation is not praying. We hear a lot of Rema. We are so blessed by them. Hey! Jesus! You write some down. You quickly cap join, caption it on Facebook. You'll be a Facebook evangelist for 12 years. And then you discover that there is no ministry on Facebook. A friend wrote something after the election. I read it. I started laughing. I told myself I will never be deceived. This media stunt. Four contestants. He showed their followership base online. All of them had more than 100,000 followers. And during the election proper, all of them combined had 81,000 followers. He now said the people on Facebook are not human beings. Don't be deceived. Alignment is the key for next level. You see 100, 2,000 likes. And then you say, oh boy, they start your... Go and start a fellowship. For eight months, you'll be five. <laughs> you will know those people on Facebook, they have a home. They are only strolling online. How much prayer power do you have? It's what will determine your seasons. 
most of your seasons are dependent on your altars. If you begin to stir that altar, you'll be sure that in six months you have more than ten promotions. You'll be so sure. I noticed a rapid migration in my life in eight months. When I didn't go anywhere, I was praying every day. Listening to messages and praying. Listening and praying. It was as if, like Ezekiel saw, that he went, it was a thousand cubits. It was at the ankle. He went, it was another thousand cubits. And it was at the knee. Another thousand cubits was added at the waist. Another thousand cubits. And the guy began to swim. He was in one position. And promotion was taking place. Volumes upon volumes were being added. It was Peter Tan that did an experiment. You know, Peter Tan is, is, is a strange prophet. Him and his friend David, they shut down for two years. They will pray in tongues for 48 hours, me meditate for 48 hours. You can go and do anything, go eat yourself, eat, come back. Pray in tongues for 48 hours, meditate 48 hours. After six months, they heard a sound. What is this? Both of them heard the same thing. They went out, they didn't see anything. They went back. The next day, they heard another sound. What's going on? And you know, when you hear a sound from eternity, nothing on earth resembles it. This is why the Bible says many people, they are hard. <laughs> people will run to the mountain and say, cover us. <laughs> Have you seen that kind of thing? You will hear a sound that we, you will die 12 times. It's possible to die 12 times. Have you watched those days when we watched movies, 24? When Alexander Mahon, the guy killed his, see his son now. He wanted to punish the guy. But this guy had been trained to withstand pain of death. So anything you do to him, he will laugh at you. He has died to pain. So the only way he can punish the guy is to make the guy die more than 10 times. So he connected a battery to his heart. And then he kept punishing him. If the guy wants to die, they have to charge and come back to life. So the guy died like 20 times. <laughs> that kind of thing can happen. So the plague of death is like that in eternity. Every time you hear a sound from eternity, you will faint. Everybody that saw God fell down like a dead man. So these men were praying and they heard sound. The third day they ran out. They now saw an angel that stood and his head was in the cloud. That was when their life changed. A point came when Peter Tam would want to think. Hmm? He can see his thought coming before his thought enter him. You know what's happening? It's functioning from eternity. So you don't think to be aware. When a thought is coming, he sees the thought coming before he enters it. And the angel will say, don't think it. <laughs> you know what has happened? Now, his voice can determine the fate of eternity. And his thoughts can emit energy that can choke eternity. So, he was brought to a place in the spirit where he can be well guided. There is a level of investment God puts on a man that if that man will violate God, God will kill him. Because if he, if he does anything, he will affect a generation. If he alters his voice, he can change the topography of the spirit realm. So Peter Tan grew to that level in the prophetic. When he's ministering, if he's doing his school of ministry, he can look at you and say, I'm seeing the spirit realm around your life. Now, this is not you in the natural. He's seeing the plane of eternity around your life. And it, I'm seeing a dark object behind you. This dark object I'm seeing is not a demon. This dark object I'm seeing, from my analysis of the object, is a temptation of lust. And because it's behind you in the spirit realm, judging the distance between you and the object, I know it happened two weeks ago. But God delivers, delivered you by doing this, doing this, doing this. That's how he operates. In fact, he will be traveling with his friend David and they can sit at the airport. They will write what they will see, where they are going, put it in their pocket. When they reach there, both of them will read it, it will be the same. 
It's not this one that you say, an angel is here. Another person said, the angel is there. That's not what I'm saying. They have access to the spirit realm. And Peter Tan did an experiment on prayer. And then he, by prophetic insight, he saw a dimension of God that was ahead of him. And the measure is like two years. I told you that story too, so that you understand what I want to say. It was like two years afar off. And then he went and started praying in tongues. He blasted in tongues for 12 hours. And then when he opened his eyes, that thing that was two years ahead of him shifted to like one year, six months. Yeah. Is this how this thing works? He now went back to prayer. And he blasted in tongues for 48 hours. And the thing that was two years ahead shifted to six months. Okay, is that so? He went back and he prayed in tongues again for another 48 hours. And he saw the thing before him. And when he stepped out, the thing began to happen. There is an influence that you can create by prayer. Some of you, listen to what I'm sharing. I'm showing you strategies of kingdom growth. The reason we pray, sometimes we organize retreats, is because we know that ministry is supposed to enter a level of influence. The influence may be scheduled for four months, but we can stretch in prayer for 12 hours every day for two weeks, and that influence is drawn close to us. And suddenly, people wake up, and everybody begins to talk, begins to talk about your ministry. It's not because you, you did any magic. No. That level of influence was ahead, but you pulled it close by prayer. There are possibilities in the spirit. There are certain promotions around your life that you should enter when you graduate. But you can do business on the altar until you can create those things. And it will bring it closer to you until a point comes when why you are on campus, you begin to do them. It's a possibility. Many don't know how things change in the kingdom. They don't know how things change. Men of understanding know. Let me show you a scriptural base. The same way demons can shift your promotion five years from you. You know God told you your promotion is now. But the devil can come and alter the circumstances and push your promotion five years. The devil can push your promotion 50 years. Meanwhile, you are 50 years old. You are supposed to die at the age of 80. And at 50, the devil shift the manifestation of 50 years, 40 years ahead of you. So you will die before your season comes. Have you not seen people that died and then they brought their promotion later? Have you not seen people that died because of money? The moment they died, they now brought their gratuity. Say, ah, we were processing this thing. The devil pushes it until you can't walk in the reality. By prayer, you can draw it close. Daniel said, I understood by books in Daniel chapter 9 verse 2. He knew that according to prophecy, Jeremiah had prophesied that the captivity would be for 70 years. They had been in captivity for 70 years. Nothing was happening. What happened? The prince of Persia shifted their deliverance away from them. And Daniel went on his knees for 21 days. What did he do? He, cons he compressed those things that were shifted away until the angel said, I was giving I came to give you skill and understanding and I was made to fly hastily I was made to fly swiftly so every process in the spirit realm began to accelerate every process in the spirit realm began to gain speed most of you are supposed to enter into dimensions of God but they are far away the devil manipulates it and it goes far away did you not read that Israel was supposed to be in bondage for 400 years how many years were they in captivity 430 years the same way the devil can shift possibilities away the same way you can use prayer to manipulate them into now you can manipulate it into now by prayer that's why I say prayer unlocks seasons seasons most of you are waiting for something to happen no, you can make it happen that's what prayer does this is why men of understanding, they don't joke with it. They live a life of prayer. You don't pray, you are robbing yourself. Most of your helpers will be drinking wine and sleeping in yacht and forget that you are existing. Don't wake up in prayer. They will be there across their leg marrying new wives. The money they should give you for your next level, they will use it and travel to the Caribbean island. They want to see what the color of the water is in the afternoon. 
the devil comes and gives them lofty appetite. The money they should give to you to buy the speakers for the next level of ministry. The guy wakes up one morning and say, I've never been to the Bahamas. I've heard stories about the Bahamas. Um, let's go to the Bahamas this week. It is your speaker money that they are going to spend in the Bahamas. Don't lock your season. Be there. They say pray. You come after 30 minutes. Shaba, 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 shaba. Ah, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Pray. You watch movies at 11.30 p.m. When your eyes are heavy. You now say, Jesus, you know I love you. I love you. And then you uh, Sometimes you carry your Bible to read. You now lie down. You open it like this. The next time you wake up, it's sun. It's the ray of the sun that wake you up. Your husband that is supposed to come is still in America trying to do PhD. And you are becoming 35 years old. <laughs> you don't activate. Prayer. It activates your seasons. And let me tell you, your seasons determine your impact in the kingdom. Your seasons, they determine your impact in the kingdom. All of us here, we have different seasons ahead of us. There's a time when you can command 100,000 followers. There's a time when you can command open doors to nations of the world. There's a time when you can command the doors of nations to open. But they can be denying you visa now. So what you need to do is to bring that season now into now. So there's an influence that will come upon you. Frank Edward told the story. He applied for visa three times. They denied him. In fact, the third time, he met the commissioner in the U.S. consulate. They said, no, go and do it. They'll give you. He went. They still bounced him. Ah! Until he went and did what he knew to do. And suddenly, they extended an invitation to him to minister the experience. And when he ministered, the next Monday he was supposed to go for visa interview and when he came the guy was smiling at him usually the interview you just come there's a glass you give them your international passport and then they begin to ask you questions it doesn't last for three minutes and then before you know they give you a green paper or a white paper that's all and when he came the guy was smiling good morning sir he said you were amazing at the experience yesterday that was his interview question Something he failed for three years. The next time he came, they didn't ask him any question. What was the question? You were amazing at the experience. Do you know whether he was supposed to attend the experience three years ago? But the season was what? Was far away. He provoked it and brought it into the now. And it became the answer to the visa interview. The reason the kingdom can't move forward is because many mighty men, their seasons are too far. Their seasons are too far. You can't enter into your season. So you can't provoke dimensions of the kingdom. Men must rise. And the men that must rise are men that understand the economy of, of the kingdom to bring their seasons close. I was teaching you yesterday how that beyond mantus, there are companies in the spirit that we belong to. Fraternities in the spirit that we belong to. Sometimes... You are looking for an impartation for the healing anointing so that you can advance the sphere of the kingdom. But what you don't know is that in the spirit you belong to the same tribe with the healing ministers in the world, but you have not entered. There are many patriarchs. Reverend Tolu was telling me about some yesterday. In this land that three God revivers opened up dimensions. Some of them could lock the heaven. Some of them could open burying wombs. Those men left this land. Their witnesses are still here. But you can't enter. Because those things are at energy levels in the spirit. This is why prayer becomes more than father. Give me bread and wine. It brings you into possibilities. Spheres of spiritual possibilities. You may be here. Nobody knows you. But you don't know that in the spirit you are in the lineage of Babanola. You don't know that in the spirit you belong to the lineage of Enoch. So when men begin to pray, God opens up doors of intimacy. Doors of intimacy. And they find things. They find things. They find things. I was sharing with you. John the Baptist thought 
he was going to be a priest because his father was a priest but it's a lie in his spiritual lineage he was in the family of elijah but he had to be in the wilderness until the day of his own for when he came what you saw was elijah he went into the wilderness as john but by interaction by prayer he connected to his true tribe and when he came out the signature of elijah was screaming at the people some of you belong to the tribe of enoch you are supposed to bring the church into dimensions of translocation not by fake doctrine but by intimacy you teach the church what to do how to pray where to enter in god through alignment and suddenly because you are there for some time many people begin to have experiences they will tell you we were praying and in our prayer meeting we saw ourselves in congo we didn't know what happened and we preached to the people in congo when we finished we slept we woke up all of us were in our bedroom it's another sphere of kingdom advancement he's not telling people to go and walk through the wall no it's a dimension in god that you enter through intimacy but only prayer can produce such dimensions when the church don't pray the church is helpless there are different spheres we can grow into in the spirit that we rob ourselves of because we are sleeping on our beds that's why i say awake thou that sleepeth and christ will give thee light you don't know that you are the deborah of your generation you are coming to fellowship you are satisfied with leading the choir singing a song who told you that's your, your your best who told you that's your best who told you you need to start a new fellowship before the dimensions of god in you break out you can be in a fellowship but the ripple effect of your prayer can be what determines the move of god in the we are kana that's why we pursue after titles we are kana that's why we pursue after fame we are kana that's why we run after opening new ministries when we know our place there are three warriors that can be somewhere the bible gave a list of 30 men that work with david work with david they were in one army but all of them had their exploit you don't need to start a new ministry to shake this land the demons don't care about the name of the ministry the demons are interested about the quality of fraternity you have in the heaven and the energy you can generate what is the quality and the texture of your fraternity only prayer can bring you there there's a measure of growth that the body of christ cannot enter until we begin to pray men of prayer must arise growth is a function of prayer it's a function of prayer it's a function of prayer but men don't pray i came to sound an alarm i came to sound an alarm the babalolas are among us the person in the house are among us but we can't see you we are seeing your title but we can't see your reality paul say henceforth no we no man after the flesh the tapas are here the katrikumas are here but we can't see you can you join into your spiritual tribe enough of titles enough of new fellowship join in the spirit until you enter into your tribe what is your tribe in the spirit what is your tribe you are struggling on the microphone when you should be on the mountain somewhere praying you don't know that men of your tribe are warriors in the spirit it is your tribe that come down and say let the heaven be locked but you are struggling with microphone you are looking for messages to preach to impress men when you should open the heaven over territories when you are there 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 when you are there, 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 when you are Make it a lifestyle. Everything you need has already been given. But there's a kingdom to advance. There's a kingdom to advance.
and mysteries because it is in mystery that our victory lies. God will create certain mysteries and it will confound the enemy. You will not know why a sister that is feeble and weak will suddenly become a warrior. Because as she begins to pray, suddenly she will be connected to the lineage of Woodward Etta. She will be connected to the lineage of Ami Semper Matrasi. You are wondering who imparted her. There's a gateway in the spirit. It's a mystery that God will bring the body into. Instead of wasting your time praying for things that are already provided, go and honor a grace and enter. You are sick. Don't waste your time praying. There's a grace in this world now that can deal with sickness. Go and honor it and receive your healing. Come and spend your prayer in kingdom advancement. Man of prayer must rise. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. One of the most precious spiritual resource now are incense of prayer. If there's anything God is looking for now, are men praying from a pure heart. Is so lacking that God will do anything to raise intercessors. Men of prayer, you are looking for prosperity? Go and connect to somebody who was the key. Honor the grace and enter. You are looking for healing? Connect to somebody that has the gate. Enter. Prayer is needed now for warfare. Prayer is needed now for kingdom advancement. We can't waste tax resources. It's a scarce resource in the kingdom. This is why God looks for men of prayer. This morning I want us to lift our voices and say, Lord, make me a man of prayer. That's the first to go. 
The first way to grow in this kingdom is by prayer. The first way to grow is by prayer. Oh, oh, oh.
precious Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to gather and to congregate under the auspices of your spirit. We are persuaded tonight that your hand will rest and descend upon us mightily to cause a quickening on our inside. We are persuaded by the reason of the supply of your grace there will be enlargement of capacities granted us even with the requisite wisdom required to extend the frontiers of the kingdom. We trust even tonight that the very reason for which your spirit have put together this meeting will not just gain momentum tonight but it will become clearer and the intensities of the energies of the spirit supplied to advance this purpose for which your spirit have designed even those dimensions will begin to find expression thank you gracious father we give you all the glory in Jesus' precious name. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. It's needful for us to realize that our world is besieged with darkness. The worst thing that can be devil a Christian at a time like this is to think by any means that the operations and the occurrences of events around his life is a function of coincidence. Every activity that you see play around your life and around your environment is a function of strategic intelligence from the, from the spirit realm, either orchestrated from the realm of God or from the demonic what constitutes an advantage is your understanding of the principles, the precepts, and the mysteries that governs the operations and the interactions of spirits. And the greatest wisdom that you will have operational in your life in a season as strategic as this is the wisdom of alignment with spirits that are responsible for the orchestration of tides of events and sequences of circumstances. However, unfortunately, only Christians are relaxed in a season that is largely characterized by warfare. Only Christians think that the things happening around us is a function of coincidence. It is so unfortunate that the operations and the events marshaled out from the spirit realm could be swallowing up an entire family and they would not have risen to the defense of the integrity of that family and securing the heritage of God for that family thinking that everything happening is a function of coincidence until the very last man standing is swallowed up. A young man finds himself running after things that are outrightly against his destiny. But he just feels that it's, a, it's an appetite. It's a desire that he has. He just feels it's an influence from a pair group. Largely does he do not realize that everything that is happening around him is a function of an orchestration by principalities hanging in the very heights of the spirit realm. Tonight I want to open your eyes to certain mysteries in the kingdom that will constitute an advantage for you, which will not just be a, a momentary deliverance, but will give you capacity to walk in the liberty that you have in Christ Jesus for the rest of your life. The best kind of deliverance you have in your life is not the type that, is, that comes upon you by reason of casting out the devil. The greatest kind of deliverance that will happen to you is the realization of the fact that you are in the midst of a warfare. And you receive energy from the Spirit of God to stand your ground in righteousness and push back the tides of darkness. Until you receive that requisite capacity of the Spirit, you are still a puppet in the hands of the devil. And nothing strengthens a man like understanding. God speaking to Job, he said, declare now if you have understanding. The only thing that gives you authority for declaration in the kingdom is the kind 
kind of understanding that you come into an account of interaction with the spirit that holds that knowledge. If you have not interacted sufficiently with an understanding of a kind of operation, you will be a slave to it for the rest of your life. Jesus sat with the disciples in Matthew chapter 16. And he began to ask, who do men say I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. And he said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the word is upon this revelation, upon this strategy that you have secured in the spirit. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The only assurance that the church has is to consistently and constantly stay fine-tuned and connected to the source of revelation. Because prevailing dominion only comes as you receive insight from heaven. He said, upon this kind of revelation, upon this strategy that you have apprehended in the spirit, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Any man that understands the technology of connection with heaven is totally delivered on earth and can never come under the authority or the influence of any other being. But most of us, we function by philosophies and ideologies that are caught from other men and we have not even proven it in our lives. The most intelligent strategy of discipleship is to connect people to the spirit realm where they can secure the voice of God for themselves. If you have not come to a point where you can secure the voice of God for yourself, what you are doing is religion and it has no life in it. It may sustain the form of godliness, but it will never have the power of the Holy Ghost. That was not the design. The design was for every one of us to know the pathways by which we can navigate into the throne room. And until we begin to apprehend realities from that realm, we don't have authority in the natural. Little wonder we come to church, many prophecies, many revelations, but little impact. Because only few know the path into the throne room. Christianity is reduced to a religion. And it's so unfortunate. Tonight, God is going to open your eyes to what you need to do in order to be a true victor in life. <laughs> Everything Jesus has done for us is legal. And it's in the spirit. Until you can trap it down in your soul, it will not be an experience. And until it becomes an experience, it has no authority to impart on existential realities. The challenges that are bedeviling you, they are real. And quoting things that are in the spirit will not change it. You must know how to travel there to secure that which is in the spirit so that you can tender it as a proof in the natural. That is when your life will begin to have meaning. It is the responsibility dimension of the Christian faith. And a lot run away from it. And they think by running away from it, they are doing themselves good. That is why we remain the way we are. But discipleship in the days of the patriarch was not the kind, or is not the kind that we have today. That's why at the age of 17, Timothy will be obtaining elders in Ephesus. He was a bishop at the age of 17 because it was not a function of age. Neither was he a function of duration in the church. It was the function of grace apprehended on account of interaction with the spirit of life. There's an error in the orientation of the faith that we practice today. Thank God for choice servants of God that have their roots in the spirit, raising a young generation like this and equipping them with the requisite knowledge to challenge darkness. Tonight is a night of revelation. As you catch it, you will enter into it. <laughs> Did you not notice when you read your Bible that Jesus never did any miracle for his 12 disciples. They didn't need it. What they needed was what we create miracles. 
when Jesus was about leaving, he came and he prayed for them. And the Bible said, open he their understanding that they may understand the scriptures. The moment their understanding was open, they had authority to control and to regulate the activities in their realm. What you need is understanding. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. Matthew 16 verse 16 And Simon Peter answered and said Thou art the Christ The son of the living God And Jesus answered and said unto him Blessed art thou Simon by Jonah For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee But my father which is in heaven And I say unto thee Thou art Peter And upon this rock I will build my church And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Before I begin to unravel the technology of revelation tonight, I'd like to show you something that Jesus pointed out. Even though the church was not yet born, Jesus emphatically specified that the gate of hell was going to contend with the church. If you are a student of the spirit, you will understand that there are different revelations for different dispensations. And every revelation that is apportioned to a dispensation must be declared upon the commissioning of God. So sometimes through intimacy with the Holy Spirit, you are carried into the realm of the Spirit and God begins to reveal things to you. And then to your dismay, God tells you never to utter it. And then if you don't have understanding, you begin to wonder, why did you have to reveal this to me if there is no need altering it? If you alter a revelation that is not backed up by a kingdom legislation, what you have done is that you have opened yourself up in the spirit realm and you become vulnerable. Because in the heavens of God, there are ranking angels that are custodians over different mysteries of the kingdom and they are watchers over different dispensations of the operations of God. There are angels in heaven that are never mobilized except a dispensation is about to open up. And there are angels that are watchers over dispensations. So whenever God is about to open up a dispensation, such angels are commissioned to go forth. Those are the angels that back up utterances and decrees from heaven that brings about an unveiling of a new kind of revelation to the earth realm. The earth realm happened to be the realm of manifestation. So realities are concluded in the spirit realm and they just break upon the earth realm by reason of the commissioning of God. And when God alters these things through men, angels are given authority to back them up even as they come to proclaim this revelation. Whenever a man, for instance, 
steps out of the jurisdiction of the utterance that God has given to him, what he has done is that he becomes open again. So his defense system becomes limited because the angels don't align with men. They align with the authority of God. That was why when Joshua went to destroy Jericho and he saw the angel of the Lord stood in, Je in Joshua chapter 6 with his sword drawn out, he said, are you for us or against us? The angel said unto him, nay, I'm neither for you, neither am I against you. But according to the word of the Lord, am I might come. He is standing with the word of the Lord. So long as Joshua aligned with the decree of heaven, the angel will walk with him. The moment he steps out, he is at the risk of being slain. And the angel will do nothing about it because they are not emotional beings. By their configuration, they are executioners. They guard the jealousy of God and they watch over the authority of God. John the Baptist was sent in the spirit and in the powers of Elias. And what was his manifesto was to bring about the revelation and, and to alter the dispensation of the coming of the Messiah. You see, but when, while John was doing that, nothing happened to him. But the day he stepped out of that assignment, that mandate that was given to him, his head was on the tree. And the angel that was given the authority to guard that which John was called to do, did nothing about it. That is how the systems operate. When Jesus declared that the church is going to stand upon the revelation, he made us understand that there is a contention against it. And that is because the same way angels are giving mandates to guard over unveiling dispensation, the same way there are ranking demons in the spirit that are watching out for breaking news from heaven. The same way there are ranking demons in the spirit watching out for unveilings of dispensation. And they will always come to fight it. So Jesus told us ahead of time that as the church is going to be unveiled, there will be attack, there will be adversary from the demonic realm. When you have this kind of understanding, the first thing you do is that you draw back and you begin to see the necessity of having the voice of the Lord. And that is why in the scripture, nobody does anything except as the voice of the Lord comes to him. The prophets were people that were always walking in delicate corridors where their lives were at risk. The reason why you saw them did dangerous things boldly and it didn't even occur to kings to kill them was because they did not utter a word except as the word of the Lord came to them. So in your time and in your dispensation today, if you are walking in a technology where you don't have understanding on how to apprehend the word of the Lord, you have actually put your life on jeopardy. So when you come to church and everything is going on, you should look out for the word of the Lord. When you go about your natural activities, you should look out for the word of the Lord. Because what you are doing is not subject to frivolities where you do it how you want or when you want. Everything you are doing is a well-legislated mandate. And if you fail on the assignment, your life is on track. A lot of Christians have not been taught the delicate balances of the spirit, so they take a lot of things for granted. And that is why a lot are cut off, and they don't even know why. Do you know that for not discerning the body of Christ, a lot of people die? For just coming to church, and then you talk against the man of God, a lot of people die. You call it coming to serve the Lord, but Paul said, for this cause, many sleep not discerning the body. This is not a demon fighting you, but this is you going against the legislation of the kingdom. It is too important for you to know how to secure the voice of the Lord and live for it. Because there are entities that are fighting against the advancement of the purposes of God. Meanwhile, it's a privilege for every one of us that have been called because until the gates of eternity are open, you will not know the meaning of life. Life has no meaning except as you are standing on a mandate. What gives you relevance in time is the kind of assignment that you are fulfilling. Else, everything on your nostril is just breath. And the day it goes, you will discover you never lived. I heard a story by Dr. Miles Moreau of Blessed Memory. He went to a tomb, taking a siesta, just relaxing and then... He was looking upon the names of the people on the grave and suddenly the voice of God came to him and the Lord told him, these people didn't live. And he said, uh -uh. 
this is their date of death now. They lived on earth and this is when they, they died. And they said, no, they only breathed the breath of life. They didn't live. Why? Because they didn't scratch the purpose for which they were created. And as far as the blueprint of heaven is concerned, if you have not scratched the purpose for which you were born, you are not factored in the purposes, in the economy, and in the workings of God in the world to come. And in case you do not know, everything we call time is not relevant, except as God has a purpose he wants to fulfill. And what will give you relevance in the world to come, where true life is, is the extent to which you fulfill the purpose for which God has brought you here. And the only way you can do that is to find out how to secure the voice of God, because God has a word for every one of us. So accurate discipleship is pushing people into the spirit realm where they can secure God for themselves. But unfortunately, more than 90% of the people in the church have never heard God. If we take a census now and say, when was the last time God spoke to you? You'll be amazed. Some persons have never heard God. But they've been Christians since the day they were born. Some are even in leadership position. Because they think the Christian corridor is like a political corridor. Where through service, through commitment, or through conversing of support, you can ascend to the ladders. But it's far from it. It is actually a work of intimacy with the spirit. Understanding the heartbeat of that spirit and conforming to his desires until that which he has in mind is better through you in your world. Life is deeper than we see it. And if you don't know it, you will not know what you are looking for. You will only be looking out, living for your appetites and the things you desire. Most of them vanish away before the very seasons you are in. You know the last time, can you remember the shoe you wore four years ago? But some people live all their life for shoes. Do you remember the food you ate three weeks ago? But some people live their life for food. What a waste. What a waste. My spirit is burdened because I'm seeing a lot of young people here. It's time for you to begin to look for meaning. Daddy told me, he said, it's a season for activating kingdom realities. What are the realities in the kingdom? <laughs> when we speak about realities, we speak of things that are both real in the spirit and in the natural. They hold sway in the spirit and in the natural. They cannot be shaken or altered in the natural. And if you enter the spirit, they will still not be shaken. For example, if you are sick now and you are a Christian, no worry. And they say you have cancer. You don't have cancer. Now, in the natural, they can even go to the lab and discover there is a growth. And they call the growth cancer. But by the time you journey through the veil of the divide and you enter into the spirit realm and you see your reality, there is no cancer there. That is because in the spirit, you have already apprehended healing. But you don't know how to transmit healing from the spirit to the natural. So in the natural, they say you have cancer. That is fact, but it's not reality. That is what? Fact. But what we are dealing with for this season is reality. Realities are things that are real in the natural and in the spirit. They still sustain the same capacity. But the greatest reality in the spirit is the person of the Christ. He's the one that controls and regulates the totality of the government, both in the spirit and in the natural. When you start talking about realities, then you begin to look at entities. You begin to look at thrones. You begin to look at laws, precepts, policies that governs the oppression of the realm. For example, the reason why fact cannot be superior to reality is that reality can alter fact. Fact can never alter reality. The day I realize that I've been healed in Christ, in the natural, the hidden power will superimpose over the cancer and it will die. But there will never be a day where my spirit will have cancer. Because what is in my spirit is reality. But what is in the natural is only temporal. That's why Paul said, why we look at the things which are not seen. He said the things which are seen, they are temporal. But the things that are unseen, they are eternal. This weekend we want to focus at the things that are unseen. Because that's what your life is built upon. And the first thing I want to open to us tonight is about the person that governs the operation of the realm. It's the beauty of heaven. In fact, for us to understand him is the reason the Holy Ghost came. 
Without him, you cannot substantiate reality. In fact, in a bold statement he made, he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The word truth there means the substance of reality. Everything that is a reality proceeds from my inside. Outside of me, nothing exists. I am the substance of reality. The question is, how many of you have met him? The day you meet Jesus, that day a lot of things will begin to break out. I'll share some test, mind-blowing testimonies with you today. And then you will realize that it's not about the stature of a man. It's about his encounters in the spirit. The cardinal reason the Holy Ghost came is so that you will know him. You will know him. Jesus said, I have many things to say to you. He said, but you can't receive it. He said, how be it when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all realities. The question is, what is Jesus talking about? What is the reality the Holy Ghost is guiding us into? He said, I am the substance of reality. So what he's telling us is that the Holy Ghost is going to carry you into the multifaceted dimensions of my being. There are different quarters in Jesus. There are different dimensions in Jesus. What you call gifts is a place in Christ. What you call power is a place in Christ. What you call prosperity is a place in Christ. Only if you will walk with the Holy Ghost, He will journey you through there. Jesus said that is the cardinal reason the Holy Ghost is coming. He will guide you into all realities. There are four major dimensions of the reality of the Christ that is revealed in the New Testament. I want to show you those four places quickly before we begin to pray. Where is the Holy Ghost guiding us to? Into all reality. What is, what is, what is, what represents all reality in the spirit? It's a person. His name is Jesus. If you have been working with the Holy Ghost accurately, you would have traveled into different places in Jesus. You would have traveled into different places. The reason a lot of people fascinate over angels is because they have not seen Jesus. He is the beauty of the spirit realm. Some people fascinate themselves over different operations. They have not seen Jesus. The day you see Jesus, you will be lost over him. Your soul will be eaten up. Your soul will be eating up. You don't know what men see that make them stay in the place of prayer for days. And they don't come out. They are not using their will. It's not their will they are exercising. It's one thing for you to go and kneel down and say I must pray for 10 hours. It's another thing to go and kneel down and be sucked into the spirit realm. You will lose consciousness of time. You are touching something. You are touching a being. His name is Jesus. The moment you see him, you will become like him. You will be sucked into him. Boneless will be secure. Is the beauty of life. He said the reason the Holy Ghost has come is to carry you into my dimensions. And you need to understand that only the Holy Ghost has the capacity to do that. You see, there are three revelators in the spirit realm. The first revelator in the spirit realm is the Father. The second revelator in the spirit realm is the Son. And the third revelator in the spirit realm is the Spirit. This is how the father reveals. What the father does is that he gives you disclosures. He gives you what? Disclosures. So sometimes you just, you are going to church, you don't know what to do, and suddenly you just feel, this is what I should do. We call those disclosures. They are knowings. 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 The father gives disclosures. But you see, disclosures are not sufficient. Because you can know about something, but you will not be there. How many of you before have had a knowing about something but you didn't have the capacity to bring it to pass you see you were given a disclosure in heaven so even the apostles when they saw the church they couldn't bring the church to pass because disclosures are not enough peter knew how the church was going to be built the son gives instructive revelations so when the son speaks to you he tells you what you ought to do it's not just a disclosure now he tells you how you need to do it but even at that you don't have the capacity to do 
The only one that gives you disclosure, instruction, and also gives you the capacity to do is called the Spirit. That is why it is only the Spirit that will guide you into all truths. Let me tell you something. You may, you may be told the symptoms of malaria. You know that you have sore throat, weakness, pains all over, and then sometimes you have headache. So you now know what malaria is. So you can identify malaria in people. You see, that's what a lot of us have. And that is why you see that we are fault finders in the church. Everybody knows, ah, this is not, this is how it should be, this is how it should be. But nobody is doing it because we only have disclosures. And then you could even come to a point where you can identify or diagnose who has malaria. But you still don't know malaria. The father will give you, this is what malaria looks like. The son will give you the description, detailed description of malaria. But the Holy Ghost wants to show you malaria. He will put malaria on you. So you will have first-hand experience of malaria. So by the time you are knowing malaria, you are experiencing malaria. You have become malaria. That's how the Holy Ghost teaches. And that is why it is the responsibility of the Holy Ghost to guide you into all realities. So what Jesus is trying to say is that, I'm about to leave this world. But you see, only people who carry my DNA can conquer the world. And the only way carriers of my DNA can come into the world is to bring a teacher who will not only talk to them about me, but as he carries them, they will become me. So when you come into the congregation of the righteous, you are not seeing Peter, you are not seeing John. You are seeing Jesus Peter. You are seeing Jesus John. Because every one of us has the DNA, the nature, and the capacity of the Christ. So God is no longer perturbed in heaven because he knows that the same ability that Jesus operated in, that same ability we are going to have. So the worst on of a Christian is his refusal to yield to the Holy Spirit. Because every time we refuse to yield to the Holy Spirit, we are subscribing to the energy of the flesh. Instead of taking the energy of the Spirit. When you begin to yield to the Holy Spirit, you now discover you are not looking like the Spirit. You are looking more and more like Jesus. Because the duty of the Holy Spirit is to carry you into all realities. Let me show you the four dimensions of the realities of the Holy Spirit quickly before we go. The first revealed in the New Testament is Jesus, the Son of God. Until that revelation becomes real to you, you will never have confidence against the devil. If you don't know Jesus, the Son of God, you will never see yourself as the Son of God. I told you what does the Holy Ghost does? As it carries you into, you'll become like him. The Bible reveals. Let's read a few scriptures very quickly. We're already out of time. You see, the street realm is so beautiful. You can tap into an economy. And then you travel beyond many dispensations to see the things that are far away from your dispensation. Are we together? It's a possibility in the spirit. So the first man that entered into this understanding was Isaiah. And it was Isaiah that began to tell us. He said, unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. The first dimension of Jesus that is relieved and re re revealed and given to the church is Jesus, the Son of God. The question is, why is it important for us to know Jesus as the Son of God? Because it is in the context of this knowledge that you will now have confidence in the fact that you, a mere mortal, can also become the Son of God. And there is no way you can explain this in articulate speech. You only know it by experience. You see, the Holy Ghost is the most important personality in the world. The Holy Ghost is the most important entity in the world. The journey of the Spirit actually begins as you begin to interact with the Holy Spirit. If you don't know the Holy Spirit, you can be accurate theologically because of many years of learning, but you will not have understanding of spiritual things. You cannot be a consultant of mysteries. You cannot give direction as, as it pertains to kingdom. Because this kind of knowledge does not come from studying. You see, the apostle said, he pleased the Holy Ghost and us 
that you should not burden this world that just came into the kingdom. You see, when Jesus left, there was no syllabus for the apostles to study. There was a serious contention in the Gentile church. Who will they consult? Who will they speak to? There was nobody. It was only as they latched the Holy Spirit and they said, He pleased the Holy Ghost and us. As you begin to walk with the Holy Spirit, the first thing He shows you is Jesus, the Son of God. That is when the credentials of Jesus is beginning to open to you. You see, you may be bedridden for many years and then they show up and tell you, Jesus is your healer. But because of the years of suffering, your suffering has become so real to you that even if they told you this is Jesus, it will be difficult for you to accept that he can do anything about it. Except as you begin to hear his credentials over and over again. The woman with the issue of blood, she heard. She heard. And when she had heard to a point that she was saturated, you know, when she was hearing, she was still consulting with doctors. Because the doctors seemed to have results. But a point came where the doctors could no longer suffice. And then at this point, the Bible recorded that she heard. She had heard about the credentials of this man. She heard so much that she said she didn't need the man to talk to her. If she could only touch the helm of his garment. From whence did she apprehend that kind of faith? By her understanding of the person of the Son of God. The capacities that this man reveals, they are not ordinary. The things that this man does, they are supernatural. Who is this man? Who? 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 So one of the things the Holy Ghost labors to reveal to you is a revelation of the fact that Jesus did not come from this realm. He came from a realm that is superior to your realm. And you must have to know it and believe it. He said, God who had sound three times and in diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophet had in this last day spoken unto us by his son. He's trying to give you a distinction between the prophets. You may have heard about Moses. He parted the Red Sea. You may have heard about Elijah. He caught fire from heaven. He said, but this one is not a prophet. He is the son of God. He said, by whom all things were made. By whom all things were made. This one I'm speaking about. He created all things. He didn't have the power to, to manipulate the causes of creation. It, it, it's not like Joshua that had to tell the moon to stop. He created the moon. That is the revelation of the Son of God. He begins to create a consciousness in your mind that He is beyond your scope of existence. And in case it has not sunk into you very well, He said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He said, the same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's the credential. The Holy Ghost will begin to reveal these dimensions to you. Until a point will come where nothing will be as real to you as the powers of Jesus. That's why the Bible tells us. He said, my son, attend to my words. He said, give thy ears to my saying. Let them not depart out of thy eyes. He said, put them in the midst of thy heart. He said, they are life to them that find them. One thing the Holy Ghost does for you is to bring you to a point where you find the son of God. Until you come there, you will never have confidence. You can be a pastor and you come to the pulpit and you are shouting, ah, ah, or you have a, you are a cell leader, or you are leading a, some young people and you are talking with, with boldness, with audacity. But they, when they bring a real life challenge, the first thing that will attack your heart is fear. That fear is not shouting, but it's more real to you than your voice. The only way you can deal with that is until the revelation of the all-powerful son of God is granted you. So when you begin to journey with the Holy Spirit, that's the first place it takes you to. It takes you to a place where you have total confidence in God. And that is when you can surrender to Him. If you don't have confidence in God, you can never surrender. Because man is designed such that his brain reads negatively. And the reason he reads negatively is to create an advantage of security for him. As we are here now, the moment you hear a sound, you will respond before you think. That's how you are designed. Is designed like you are designed like that to keep you safe. So you cannot trust what you don't, you, you cannot rely on what you don't trust. So the Holy Ghost will first of all carry you into a realm of God where you can trust Him. 
And most people have not even as much as come there. And it doesn't matter how bogus we talk about it. We have not come there. Don't allow your heart deceive you. You can be a leader. You can even be running a fellowship. And you are saying bogus things that you don't believe. Don't allow your heart to deceive you. Better go and settle down first. Kenny Hagin said he read the New Testament 150 times before he began to speak. He was called, he settled this matter in his heart. He settled it. Is it settled in your heart? If it's not settled in your heart, you will trust in other things. And it's so unfortunate that even though you are not saying it, in the spirit realm it is real. Because your thought is tangible there. Here your thought is intangible. But in the spirit realm, your thought is tangible. The angels are seeing it and even demons are seeing it. So when you start now, you are proclaiming with authority, the demons will just be laughing. Because you can deceive the people. But in the spirit realm, fear is standing on your head like, like a sword. It is visible. We have come to a church where everybody is talking big. Talking big, all kinds of lofty things. But we believe so little. That's why our results are very little. You must follow the Holy Spirit. That's the first revelation in the Bible about Jesus. The Son of God. The angel appeared to Mary. And he said, That thing that is formed in you, it shall be called the Son of the Highest. This must be formed in you. Because that will become the basis of your conviction. A lot don't have conviction. And that's why we trust in uncles, we trust in money, we trust in people, we trust in things. There are some who have graduated for six years. They have received disappointment continually, but they have never been able to shift their trust. Because they don't have any other object of trust. It's a pity. But that's how we live. And the reason is because we have not apprehended the Son of God. He said, Thus said the Lord. He said, Woe unto the man that trusted in man, who maketh flesh his arm, he said, whose heart departed from the Lord. The day you make any other thing your trust, what happens to you that you are not aware of is that your heart has already departed from the Lord. He said, It shall be like the heat in the desert. He shall not see good when he cometh. He shall live in the past places of the desert, a salt land that is not inhabited. Most of us, we are not even aware that our heart has departed from the Lord. We keep trusting things, trusting things. The first thing you need to do today in order to begin to orchestrate an activation of the mysteries of the kingdom is for you to come back to the Holy Spirit and ask Him to reveal to you the Son of God. You can quote Him. It doesn't mean you know Him. But they that do know their God. <laughs> they that do know their God. They shall be strong. And they shall do exploits. That's the first thing the Holy Ghost does for you. And the second thing the Holy Ghost does. Is that he reveals to you. Jesus. The Savior. Jesus, the Savior. When you know Jesus, the Son of God, and you develop strong conviction and confidence, then the Holy Ghost reveals to you Jesus, the Savior. It's so amazing how sequentially these things are placed in the Bible. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. Look at what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Are we together? He said, but why he thought on these things? That's Joseph. Contemplating on what to do regarding his wife. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not 
to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, after the son, what next? And thou shalt call his name Jesus. The second revelation, the second reality that the Holy Ghost carries you to, is the reality of Jesus the Savior. Most of us are still not sure of our salvation. And so we are weak. We are weak in our contentions. We are disadvantaged in our operations. Because we have not come to a full assurance of our salvation. The totality of salvation is within the scope of the name of Jesus. I wish I had time to talk about salvation tonight. It is in Jesus that you find the incarnation. It is in Jesus that you find the birth. It is in Jesus that you find the suffering and the death. It is in Jesus that you find the resurrection. It is in Jesus that you find the ascension. And all of these five things have five different implications. There was no way the fallen man could satisfy the claims of divine justice. There was no way atonement could be made for man. Because nothing on earth was devoid of corruption. Only a reality that came from the realm of God himself had the capacity to sustain a, 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 a disposition that is void of corruption. And that substance that came from the realm of God is a person called Jesus. On account of his purity, by reason of where he came from, he has the capacity to pay, to be rendered as a ransom. So the incarnation itself is a revelation of the quality of sacrifice that God provided for atonement. It is in the death that the old man is dealt with. And there are two things that happen in the death. One pertains to the blood, the other pertains to the cross. The blood deals with the sins you commit. The cross deals with the sin nature. Apostle will always tell us. He said you could go around the town and collect all the beer bottles. Maybe more lager beer and destroy all of them. But if you have not done anything about the factory, you have wasted your time. So when the blood was spilled, it took care of the committed sin. But the cross, it deals with the nature of sin, the serpentine nature that we succeeded from Satan. And carrying the cross is a lifelong reality. The Holy Ghost will teach you and he will place the cross upon you every day. It is one of the greatest burden. You see, there are five things you die to as a human being. You will die to sin. You will die to Satan. You will die to judgment. You will die to the world. But the fifth thing, which is the hardest to die to, is flesh. To die to flesh, God does not do it absent of your own consciousness. You will do it with your eyes open. That's what the Bible means when they say we are living sacrifices. That's where you die to self. You cast yourself, you cast your appetite, cast your ambition away at the instance of the voice of God. And that is where you really become like God. The only way to put out the old man is to pick your cross. And picking your cross is dying to self. And if you don't die to self, you can never do business with God. You see, God is Father. So as Father, there are lots of things that you can do. You know, you fall today, come tomorrow, say, Lord, I'm sorry, because he's Father. And he will keep you as son. But if you want to come to kingdom legislation, you will not meet a Father. You will meet a judge. And in meeting with a judge, you will interact not by love, you interact by laws. When you are interacting with Father, it's on the basis of love. But when you are interacting with the judge of all, you are interacting based on law and righteousness. Because in kingdom legislation, warfare is involved. There are entities that will cut you off 
and because they are subscribing to the laws of the spirit, there is nothing God can do about it. There are demons that will cut you off because you stepped out of the provision of the laws of righteousness and there is nothing God can do about it. Paul began to talk about warfare. He said, why you have done all this to stand? He says, stand thereof. Because there is a possibility that you will not stand when you are done. This is kingdom legislation. So he said, you should be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The word power, there is the word kratos. Might is the word iskus. Kratos is not the same power you receive when you receive the Holy Ghost. And yes, shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's dynamis. That one is a potential power. Kratos is dynamic power. This light you are seeing is Kratos. Light came because the gem, the dynamo in the gem has taken off. What you have with the Holy Spirit is the dynamo. But you have to activate the dynamo until it becomes like this. Before you can even begin to talk matters of warfare. So a Christian who does not engage in tongues until power is activated in his inside is not even a candidate of warfare. That's Kratos. And then Iskus is military might, participation with other forces in the spirit in order to advance the kingdom of God. That one has to do with your understanding of the operation of the angelic. Because that is the other army that we war with. You know, God we told we tell David that when you see the wind move against the mambri tree, I have gone ahead. So the reason he won many battles was not because he was so strong. It was not because of his military intelligence. It was because of partnership. That kind of power is called Iskus. That was the kind of power Daniel engaged after he prayed for 21 days. And the angel Gabriel said, I have been caused to fly swiftly so that I may give you skill and understanding. And when Gabriel was not sufficient, Michael was sent again to contend with who? The prince of Persia. That is not a demon. That is a fallen angel. You cast out demons. You don't cast out fallen angels. You war with them. You don't know why a lot of us are shouting things but people are dying. Not every category of the demonic is a demon. Some are fallen angels. They can appear in the presence of God. So that you are worshipping does not mean they will go away. Jesus finished fasting for 40 days and Satan came and said, come. <laughs> fallen angels. You know, Paul was the one that told us casting down imagination and every high standing thing that opposes itself above the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity all things to the obedience of Christ. When your obedience is fulfilled, you fulfill, you avenge other disobedience. That was when he was young in the faith. If you go and check the chronology of the writings of Paul, he began with 1 Thessalonians. He ended with Colossians, Ephesians, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Go and see the things he wrote there. They are mysteries. It was in the book of Ephesians where utterance was granted him that he began to talk about warfare. That time he didn't say cast down. He said, first of all, you must be kitted with the whole armor of God. If you don't have the armor of God, you will die. And you don't walk with a fallen angel by shouting the name of Jesus. You walk with them by Rema. By Rema. If you don't understand the technology of Rema, you can't walk because it's the sword of the spirit. If you have not known how to catch Rema in the place of prayer, you can't war with them. And Paul said they will throw fiery darts at you. Some of those darts are cancers. Some of those darts are hepatitis. Some of those darts, they are different things that will malign your destiny. So there are a lot of things required. But only a Christian who has died can travel the extra miles. Because only a dead Christian can legislate the kingdom. The kingdom is not for living men, it's for dead men. The only life that springs out of them is the life of the Christ. The one that sits in the office of the Christos. It's not for dead men. Have you not noticed the operation of the sanctuary? When you enter through the gates, the gate is the full revelation of Jesus as the king, the son, the servant, and the, 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 the life of God. When you enter through the gate with thanksgiving, then you come to the altar of sacrifice. You place yourself there. When you have dropped yourself, before you start legislation, Everybody can be in the outer court. Only the priest enter the inner court. Because before you enter the inner court, you must come into relationship with the Holy Ghost. In the lava where you wash your hand, that is the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. If you have not entered into intercourse with the Holy Spirit, forget about kingdom legislation. You are a babe. You are not relevant for the equation of God. In the world to come, your name will not be mentioned. 
That world is for overcomers. Everybody will be there, but not everybody will be a captain. Not everybody will be relevant. You journey there by salvation, but you are relevant there by service. You wash and you enter. When you enter, you begin to navigate, do kingdom matters. You receive strength from the table of showbread. You receive illumination from the menorah. That time there is no sunlight anymore. In the outer court, everybody can use the sunlight. But in the inner court, if you have not received light from the world, you can't go forward because only the lampstand shines there. And if you have journeyed to the point of the high priest, after the altar of incense, then you enter the Holy of Holies. Where true kingdom business is done. There, there is no light. It's the Shekinah that illuminates you. You must have traveled into the spirit until you can see for yourself. A lot of Christians are not raised. We have never journeyed anywhere. We live for our appetites. Bogus appetites. Young people. Full of pride. A generation of proud men. We come and then we talk down on the fathers. How can he say this? This thing he said is wrong. You have revelation that have not been proven. Your revelation have not discipled 10 people. And you are, you, are, you are correcting a bishop that has stood for 30 years. Do you know what it means to stand with God for 10 years? You know what it means to stand for 20 years? You have not even done your Christian faith for two decades. You are correcting a bishop in arrogance and folly. That is why we die in our generation. We are cut off because of our foolishness. We know nothing. We don't even labor to enter into the rest. But we are willing to talk. It is in the death that all your appetites and your ambition are sacrificed. The Holy Ghost will take you there. In the resurrection, you enter into the newness of immortality. It is in the resurrection that you have confidence to survive in the world to come. Paul said, if only in this life we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. He was not quoting from the Old Testament. That is what he caught when he was traveling with the Holy Spirit. He realized that the gate through the portals of the divine was the gate of revelation. Anybody that has crossed into the resurrection of Christ, he has hope. And if there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. Paul was the one that told us that. He didn't read it from anywhere. He caught it in the spiritual. He discovered that the crucible of the Christian faith is resting upon the resurrection. If you have not caught the revelation of the resurrection, there is no hope of immortality for you. And that is why when you gave your life to Christ, what you confessed was the risen Christ. Because in the resurrection, you cross from the gateway of death into the regions of life. Immortality is factored into the revelation. When you see Christians that are not sure of tomorrow, it's because they have not known the resurrection. The Holy Ghost will carry you through those realities. Carry you through all those realities until you come to a point where you have apprehended the soul. All of that is in Jesus. It is in the ascension. Oh my God. It is in the ascension that authority is conferred. Have you seen Christians that lack authority? So much. They have fasted for 30 days before coming for the meeting, but they are still not sure. The problem is not the activity. They don't understand who they are in the ascended Christ. The ascension is another, is another dimension of reality that the Holy Ghost will take you to. All of that is factored into the economy of the administration of God. That is what the office of the Christ is currently doing. The office. The office of the Christ is responsible for the totality of the administration of heaven. It is by that office that you are giving a ministry. Have you not wondered why some people are in church for 15 years but they are not responsible? They are not in leadership. They just feel Christianity is come, take from God and go away. But the Bible says when Moses was come of age, when he was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God than to enjoy the pleasures of Egypt that was for a season. He came of age. When you come to a point where the resurrection becomes real to you, then you begin to look for responsibility in the kingdom. That is why Jesus never gave any ministry office except as he was ascended. He said, him that ascended, what descended was the same that ascended on high. And he said, as he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. To some, he gave to be apostles. Some, he gave to be prophets. Some, he gave to be evangelists. Some, he gave to be pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the sin. That question is a long age question of redemption. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 and 8, the Bible says, Who has believed our report? Unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And in verse 8, it says, Who shall declare 
his generation. The man that will declare his generation is the man that has caught the revelation of the risen Christ. He now knows that he's not in God only for what he can get. God also has need and is looking out for it to meet it. So he discovers himself worshipping God and crying. Worshipping God every day like a personal assignment. Why? He has come to a point where he knows that the Father is seeking through worshippers. He has come to a point where he has realized that his life, his life should be an extension for the pleasure of God. When John was carried to heaven, he saw the 20 and 4 elders fall to the ground, worshipping. Fall to the ground, worship. The man was left in total oblivion. Is this not heaven where people come to rest? The Bible said the four beasts, they worship in day and night. Forever and ever. And then the 20 and 4 elders that were already seated on throne, they will cast their crown and fall on the ground flat. What is happening here? I thought heaven is a place of fun and pleasure. We suffered on earth so that when we die, we'll come to heaven and rest. No, you don't rest in heaven. Heaven is a place of ministry. That's what he caught the elders doing. They were worshipping him. Worshipping him that is called holy. Holy, holy, holy. Separate. You are different. You are in your own class. You see, the angels don't have a word for God. They, they can't even give him a name. They only call him, you are separate in your own class. You are in your own class. Because every day they see him, the illumination becomes brighter. They see many dimensions. They can't understand. Which being is this? They say, holy. Holy. You don't know the privilege that you have as a man. And you don't know the opportunity that you have in time. When you get to heaven, that is when most of us will realize what we have wasted in time. Are you aware that the angels don't know God by experience? They are like, what they have is what was configured into them. The only way God can be known is by his spirit. Only man has the spirit of God. That is why the Bible said in Ephesians 3.10 that the principalities shall watch as the church will teach them the exceeding mysteries of God. It was man that said God is love. It was man that said God is light. It was man that said God is powerful. The only thing the angels call God is holy. The word holy is not a name. It means be in your own class. Separated unto your own name. There is none like you. They don't know you. They look upon your life to learn about God. But you are here wasting away because you refuse to follow the Holy Ghost. How do you expect to become relevant? We were coming and my friend told me in the car. He said, imagine the population in Kaduna alone. He said, serving God was not about heaven. He said... How do we even expect to survive with this kind of competition? Even if serving God was only for this life, how can one survive with this kind of competition? The only advantage we have is the spirit we fraternize with. Fraternity with spirit is what constitutes an advantage in time. That's why you see somebody selling pure water and say millionaire. It's not about the pure water. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. And spirit life is not given to verbosious and very large exegetical explanation. It is making a choice to follow. If it is so hard, God will not expect every man to do it. So it's not a function of very difficult and intrinsic languages. It is weaved into every man. Every one of us hear him. Jesus said, my sheep heareth my voice. Everyone. The question is the question of obedience. Will you follow the Holy Spirit? The people that know the risen Christ, they don't know him because they are special. They knew him because they started traveling with the Holy Spirit. There was a point in their life when all they knew was the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. Then they would come and say, do you know the Son of God? They kept following the Holy Ghost. A day came, suddenly, it dawned on them that Jesus was their healer. A day came, it dawned on them that Jesus was their life. A day came, it dawned on them that Jesus was the reason they were living. They carried their Bible and began to preach. If Jesus is the reason I'm living, I will do his will. So it is a journey with the Holy Spirit. It's not a function of study. It's not a function of, 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 of so much learning or traveling. From where you are in your niche, if you will subscribe to the Holy Spirit, a strange dimension can break out upon your life. 
I've read stories about great men of God. Great women of God. People like Katrin Kuma. A woman that could not as much as find a man to love her genuinely. That was the level of rejection she suffered. But there was the Holy Ghost waiting for her to make her a specter in her generation. The day she subscribed, if you listen to her, you will be sleeping. She, could, she did not as much as have a very effective way of communication. But all she had was the Spirit. And by the Spirit, she shook her world. It's the question of obedience. From where you are, are you willing to subscribe? Because there is a long journey the Holy Ghost will take you. And it's not a function of time, it's a function of realities. The encounters that you have is what will make you become that which you only imagine. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus is the Lord. That's the last revelation that launches you into the realm of power. Jesus the Lord. How many know Jesus the Lord? You see, the Bible says Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. What it means is not just that Jesus is the one that bets faith on your inside. No. What it also means is that Jesus is the example of faith that we follow from the beginning to the end. The only way he entered into power was by absolute obedience. Absolute obedience. When he began, he came to John the Baptist. John had hyped him. The one that cometh, even the latchet of his son, I'm not worthy to untie. <laughs> and then here comes Jesus and knelt down to be baptized. And John said, No, 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 no. I should be baptized of you. He says, Suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh of us to fulfill all righteousness. He finished, and the Bible said he was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost to be tempted of the devil. He followed. And when that sequence of trials was completed, he returned in the power of the Spirit. And the power he returned with was the power to serve in humble obedience. You will think that now that he has power, he can do what he wishes, but he was still a slave of the Holy Spirit. So the Bible said, because of this kind of obedience, he said God has given him a name that is above every other name. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. It's not because he did something in warfare. He didn't fight the spirit. He didn't fight humanity. He only obeyed the Holy Ghost. He obeyed to a point where he said, at the mention of that name, every knee will bow. Why you have authority is not because of your proclamation. It's not because of the warfare you stand on the street or the rage you rage when you carry the microphone. It's the extent of obedience and submission you give yourself to in the privacy and the quarters where you rest your head in your private chambers. A lot of rebelliousness. But when we come to church, we are all an example to be followed. Apostle told us, he said the hallmark of the Christian faith is secret purity. Strict righteousness and generous kindness to others. Because of his obedience, he said God has given him a name that is above every other name. At the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee bows. Every tongue confesses that Jesus is the Lord. The name is not Jesus. The name is the Lord. Because Jesus was given when he was born. The name is what? That Jesus is the Lord. The Lord is Jehovah. The Almighty. And because he's the author and the finisher of your faith, that part he has crafted is what you and I will follow. A point came where we sprang out, all of us praying for power. Power, power, power. God, give us power. We must have power. But when understanding began to come to us, When understanding began to come to us, that was when we realized that power is not what you pray for. You become it through obedience. You become it through obedience. And most of us came into our rest. So the extent of obedience that you give in 
is the extent of power that you will see. Will you yield to the Holy Spirit? Some of us here, the, the Lord have been perturbing us for many days, many months. Many months. Some is, you wake up and then you feel a leading to fast. But you don't. Meanwhile, whenever they give a fasting week in church, you want to show that you are the only one that completes the fast. What you are doing is that you are fertilizing your appetite. You are strengthening the flesh. The secret instruction that comes to you from the Holy Spirit is what will change your life. You go out there, you want to engage in the quarrel. He says, hmm. But you go ahead. That's why you will remain where you are for a long time. For a very long time. Power is not what you necessarily pray for. Power is a thing you become through obedience. As you follow the Holy Spirit, He will carry you through these four different chambers of God. He will introduce you to Jesus the Son where your conviction is strengthened and you have confidence in God beyond everything. He will introduce you to Jesus the Savior where you have an assurance beyond anything that happens to you or comes your way. He will introduce you to the Christ where you will have the needed assurance and capacity to serve Him in an acceptable fashion. And then He will introduce you to Jesus the Lord where you have authority over the contrary forces that fight against advancing the purposes of God. This you don't come into by doctrine. You don't know it by doctrine. You know it by experience. And you only come into this reality as you follow the Holy Spirit. As you follow the Holy Spirit, He will guide you there. He said, how be it when the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide us into all realities. Can we bow our heads as we begin to pray? Today is just to set the coordinates. So that we we'll prepare our hearts. That the goal is not performance. The goal is becoming. The first layer of power that came upon you was power to become. He said, as many as received it, to them he gave power. To become the sons of God. And you cannot become except as you begin to see and interface with the person of Jesus. The multifaceted dimension of his reality. You must begin to see him. You must begin to see him. You must begin to see him. He said, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. It does not yet matter what we shall be like. He said, but when we shall see him, we shall be like him. That's an apostle that have operated in the highest realm of power. But he knew that what was important to God was becoming. You can be a Christian for one month and you will begin to see him and become like him. You can be a Christian for 10 years and you may never have seen him. You may never have been like him. And in the privacy of your heart, you know that you are far. Christianity is not an act. It's not an activity. It is the operation of divinity in a, hum in a human vessel. The extent to which God can find expression through you is the measure of your maturity in the faith. The extent of which you have become like Him is who you truly are in the Spirit. I'm delighted tonight because there are many young people here. You have heard a lot of things, heard a lot of revelation, heard a lot of rema. But what have you become? Those private things you do in your private chambers, will you be bold to do them in the public? Those are the things that count with God. It's not the things you say to the public. It's not the things you do to the public. Who before God? That's the question of all ages. If you come, be upstanding as we pray to the Ghost. The transforming power of God is about to hit the building. The transforming power is about to hit the building. Chatea Brando. Rahiba Bundo Saparadas. Rakapa Teke Bundo Sakapa. Shakapa Rapa. The power. Holy is your name. With everything I've got, my heart to go to the How I love you. Deceive people. Deceive pastors. Deceive pastors. 
to do what I have to do next. Can we have it quiet for a moment? I want to give some persons an opportunity. You see, you may have been so involved in so many activities. You may even be a leader. But you know that in the privacy of your heart, you are far. You are far. Because you don't really know this Jesus. Maybe you know the Son of God, but you don't know the Savior. Maybe you know the Savior, but you don't know the Christ. And because you don't know the Christ, you have been rebellious in the place of service. I want to give an opportunity to few persons who want to make it right with God. You want to receive that empowerment for service tonight. You want the Holy Spirit to lead you into that place of experience. The experience of God. You see, you can be in the Spirit. John was in the Spirit in the Isle of Patmos. But he heard a voice. He said, come up here. There are deeper places in God. You want to journey to those places. I want to give you an opportunity. To step out tonight. And I will pray with you. You see, the greatest things don't happen where people are shaking and falling most of the time. I know the cause to touch, to throw everybody under the power. I know the call to touch, to get everybody so fascinated that they don't even hear what I'm saying. But they will be so fascinated. But we want something tangible to begin to happen in the lives of people. We are a young generation. We must know God by experience. The fathers knew him experientially. That was why they had impact. They are not quoting scriptures the way we are quoting. They are not talking in arrogance the way we are talking. For them to conquer nations, to shatter the foundations of kingdom, was because they knew their God. A lot of us don't know Jesus. A lot don't know Jesus. And it doesn't matter what you are doing in church. It doesn't matter where you are in church, where you are seated in church. It doesn't matter who knows you. The question is, are you on the registers of heaven? I want you to make a commitment to Jesus. Talk to him now. I will serve you with all my heart. I will serve you with all my might. As you make that commitment, very soon the power of God will begin to rest upon people. Just make that commitment. 
I don't want it to be an emotional thing. I don't want it to be an emotional thing. You know, we know this song. Sometimes when we sing songs that are that touches our emotion, we, we respond by emotion. We don't know. We think it's the spirit. Make a conscious commitment to Jesus. Make a commitment. Make a commitment. Some of you will find yourself, you will begin to weep. Not because anybody tried to do anything emotional. The compassion of Jesus will begin to overwhelm you. Overwhelm you. Overwhelm you. Overwhelm you. A deep commitment. It's a deep commitment. It's a deep commitment. Very deep. Jesus tonight. This is the most important part of the meeting. You, you stop praying now. Now you stop praying. Stop praying. Stop praying now. I want to pray for you now. The hand of God will come upon you. Some of you it will break hardness in your heart. Some of you it will trigger conviction. Some of you the compassion of the Holy Ghost will overwhelm you. Some of you will even begin to receive activation of spiritual gifts now. Precious Holy Spirit. You know, we've not come to do an emotional thing or a religious activity. Look upon the hearts of your children that have come to make a commitment to you. Touch them now. Touch them now. Touch them. Touch them. Touch them. them. Holy Ghost, breathe upon them. Let every yoke be broken now. Let the yokes be broken. Let the yokes be broken. Let the yokes be broken. Begin to quicken them with the fire of your spirit. Begin to quicken them. 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 The hand of God is coming now. See, we are used to we are used to hard large volumes and the rest. Just know the Holy Ghost is brooding upon your heart. This one is called transforming power. Transforming power. Brooding through your hearts. Breaking yokes. Breaking yokes. It's doing a, a lasting, a long lasting transformational work within you. Just stay focused on the Holy Spirit. Mm. 
Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me Just stay focused on Jesus. Deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I love you. are in love. Take me deeper. Deeper in love. Can you stretch out your hands and pray for them? Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Let God strengthen them with might by His Spirit in the inner man. This decision you have made is a commitment. Spirits, spirits respond very greatly to commitment. Spirits. It's not a word you have uttered. That's why I tried as much as possible not to make it emotional. So that you will know that it's a tangible commitment you have made. Stick to it. Stay by it. Give your life for it. Never. Never, never relent on this commitment you have made. Please walk out this way. If there's somebody who is going to talk to you, what you need to do, is there a counselor or something? Direct you out. Or better still, you can write your name, submit with your phone numbers. They'll get back to you later. You need to be instructed on what to do. Are we together now? You need to be instructed. So, as you go back, just drop your name and your phone numbers. You'll be communicated on what you need to do. But don't go back a lukewarm Christian again. Never. Never. It's time to make a decision. God bless you. You can go back. In the next one minute, lift up your hands now and begin to make demands. Begin to make demands now. We are done with transformational matters. It's time to deal with tangible things. You came with needs. You came with burdens. This is the time. This is the time. This is the time. This is the time. I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you 
to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.